Hi everyone, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Good morning. We finally have another launch, and this one is uh, going to be really exciting. Hang on, I'm going to switch something real quick here to try and get that little clock going better. Sometimes it does this. There we go. <laughs> 34 minutes until we have a Starlink launch, and that's really exciting because this is the uh, this is the second Starlink launch, but it's actually like the first of like truly operational Starlink. And um, let me we have a lot to talk about on this, so let's start off by going to um, a certain website called EverydayAstronaut.com and uh, clicking on pre-launch previews. And there we can click on this mission, Starlink, and we'll see here it shows up as being in about 33 minutes or so. Um, it's kind of hard to read on that white background, but here we go. Uh, we're just going to do a rundown on this, and before we even get started, um, I know a lot of you are going to be asking about my dad, who uh, I had to sp uh, I spent last week um, and the weekend with him in the hospital. Uh, thank you so much for all of you who, who sent nice notes and said that your you know thoughts and prayers are with me and my family. That always means a lot. So thank you. He um he does have to have his artificial heart valve uh, got infected basically and will need immediate replacement. So I'm going to be kind of running around between here and Minnesota for the next, uh, for the probably the rest of the week or so. So uh, thank you so much to all of you uh, for your support. That really means a lot. Um, he's in literally some of the best hands in the entire world, though. So uh, we're all cheering for him. So go Russ, go Team Russ. If you guys uh, want to, yeah, maybe hashtag Team Russ. I don't know. But uh, anyway, just thanks to all of you for saying that, um, saying all those nice things. Okay, back to the mission. Um, today is... SpaceX uh, Starlink 1, technically, uh, or they're actually just starting to call it Starlink. I don't even know if they're going to label these because these are going to become so routine that we're going to get sick of seeing these. This is going to be the first of like, <laughs> uh, they're hoping to do 24 of these launches next year, so every other week. And in other words, I'm probably not going to stream all of them. I probably physically can't stream all of them. Um, so yeah, so it's going to be taking off, oh, at, not at 9.34, what did I do? I made a boo-boo. Um, this is Starlink 1, the first operational Starlink Constellation launch, um, being launched by SpaceX. The customer for this mission is also SpaceX, because these are SpaceX satellites, which is pretty unusual. Um, <laughs> and this is being launched on, uh, Falcon 9 Block 5. This is 1048.4, and so that dot .4 means this is the fourth flight of this booster. This is the first time a booster has flown four times. So that's really exciting too. Um, this is taking off at Launch Complex 40 or LC40 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in, in Florida. And remember again, uh, LC40 means Launch Complex. That means that's uh, that instead of being SLC, if you see something that says SLC, that's Space Launch Complex. And technically that's, um, that's actually at uh, NASA's uh, Kennedy Space Center. LC40, which is literally like, right next door they're they're touching i mean this is like two, three kilometers away from 39a um but still it's launch complex 40 which means it's at cape canaveral air force station so just a, a fun reminder uh payload mass 13,620 kilograms so um this is actually i believe this is the heaviest mission ever because each satellite now is a little heavier they kind of changed the materials around it, it is now 100 percent disposable um and all that stuff so it's um, it is the heaviest they've ever done. Um, low Earth orbit, initial orbit is 450. I've also seen contradicting things saying 250 kilom kilometers. Uh, we might have to double check that. Sorry. Um, it's been a hot minute. <laughs> um, they are re uh, they will be attempting to recover the stage despite it being their heaviest payload ever. Um, the auton they will be landing this on the autonomous spaceport drone ship. This is, of course, I still love you. Uh, 628 kilometers downrange. Um, again, making it about as far out as any Falcon 9 will ever go, basically. It's like pushing the Falcon 9 to the absolute limits, and why not? You know, why not push it as far as they can when it's their own payload? They're the customer. Yeah. Will they be attempting to recover fairings? This actually changed this morning. No. No, they are not attempting to recover the fairings with, with uh, Mystery and, and Mischief. Wait, who is it nowadays? Uh, yeah. They, they are no longer actually attempting to recover them. Uh, sounds like those boats actually may have had to turn around because of high seas and dangerous conditions. Um, so whoops. Um, <laughs> these fairings are not new though. So this is another thing that's pretty exciting. This is the, um, 
Uh, sorry, the weight is wrong on this. I, I apologize. It's eighteen point five tons. Man, I need. I just updated this yesterday, and we were, we got a bunch of stuff. Sorry, my life has been crazy lately. Um, I just got back into town last night, so some of these numbers are off. I will be updating those. Um, but this is the crazy thing. These fairings have flown before, and actually, Trevor Malman had some pictures of the fairings. They even added a little watermark, <laughs> a water mark. You know how like they have like the ISS donations, uh, denotions. What's the word when, you know, when they fly a, a dragon capsule to the International Space Station, they put a little, pff, um, they also do it now with boosters, uh, how many times they've flown or, or do they even do that anymore? But anyway, they put a little a squiggly saying that these have been like splashed down, which I think is pretty fun. So these fairings are actually used. This is really the first time ever that a fairing's ever been reused. They, even though they're like $6 million, typically they get thrown away. So that's awesome. So this is the 75th flight of a Falcon 9, 19th flight of a Block 5, 11th mission for SpaceX in 2019. So it wasn't a very busy year for, for SpaceX, really, um, altogether. So, um, yeah, let's see. Uh, then we have, of course, a wonderful image from Jeff Barrett here. Uh, and then we have a small rundown here as well. So, um, yeah, this is a, a picture. This is the old picture. I should probably pull up. They, they did get an, a new one up last night, of course. Let me see. Let me try and find this. Look at this. Oh, man. How crazy is that? So, yeah. So, the, remember, they, they stack 60 of these babies. They're in pairs. They're side by side. So, 30 in each stack. And, uh, and then when they let go of them, they basically spin the upper stage, <laughs> like, on its end, end over end. Um, like this, and then, uh, then they, they just like let a pin open up basically like this giant pin type of thing just goes bling. And then they just go flying off like a deck of cards. Uh, just crazy. I, I think very few people would have ever tried to do anything like this, but, uh, go SpaceX. They, they made a way to make it work. So this is pretty sweet. Pretty excited for this mission. Um, yeah, we're going to probably just answer some of you guys' questions here uh, while we wait. We have, what, 27 minutes left. Nice and early. I like this. And, and the live stream isn't going to start until about T-minus 10 minutes. So, whoops. Um, but that doesn't matter. Okay, let's answer a couple of your guys' questions. Scott Silver's a new member. Thank you so much. Scott Brown, hi. Beck, good morning. And Patrick, <laughs> I awaken. Uh, Scott Brown, thanks for the great videos and keep doing what you love. Thank you very much. Um, BMW1000cc. Well, actually, just BMW 1000C. I don't know if that's cubic centimeters or just 1,000 centimeters of a BMW. <laughs> Thanks, BMW. How's it going? Uh, Vincent H., uh, keep up the great work. Thank you so much. Uh, Blazing Tank stopping by. <laughs> Free cash. Thank you. JW. Thanks, Tim. Go Team Russ. There we go. Thank you. Uh, poor girl. Uh, I, I, talk, I briefly touched on my, my dad's health earlier in the, in the stream. Um, but basically, my, my dad's in really good hands. His uh, quick run, rundown again, my, my dad has an artificial heart valve. He had a bicuspid heart valve at birth um, when he was basically 60 years old-ish or 59. Um, he had a uh, an artificial heart valve, aortic heart valve put in. And so they, uh, they replaced that. And then it happened to get infected, which is really bad. Um, and that caused... Uh, the artificial heart valve to begin to fail. And he was actually in Europe when when things were starting to go awry, which is pretty scary. So luckily he's back home. Um, he got sent up to, uh, to Mayo Clinic in Rochester, which is literally one of the best hospitals in the world. <laughs> like literally, definitely one of the best in the United States. Um, and uh, so that that's good. He's in really, really good hands. Um, the infectious disease team, an actual team of people has a really good handle on, on uh, what to do there. And, uh, yeah. And so he's actually, he does have to have his, his heart valve replaced already, which is a bit of a bummer cause it's only been in there for six years. Um, and this is kind of the last time they can actually replace the heart valve. Um, so that's kind of scary, but, um, you know, from then there's also options like Tavers and other things, but as far as an active lifestyle, um, we're really hoping this operation goes really smoothly and everything goes well. Uh, it's been kind of a long couple days for us just kind of trying to figure out everything. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I really appreciate though, just seeing the over overwhelming response from the space community has been incredible. I mean, like, like, uh, the CEO of Iridium and, and, and Tori Bruno and all these people commenting, like we're thinking of your dad just really, really means a lot to me and my family. So thank you guys. Um, so I'll be, I, I, I might not be as online as normal because I'm going to be going back and forth here. Um, I live in, in Northeastern Iowa, 
So um, luckily, it's it's not too far away from Mayo Clinic, but um, but yeah, I'll be kind of on the road quite a bit here, and and of course now the roads are horrible. There's like uh, inches of snow last night, so um, I got home in time, but yikes! Hopefully by the time I make it back up there, the roads have cleared back down a little bit. So yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, thanks, poor girl. Gary Lane, uh, thanks as always. Uh, have a coffee. Glad your dad is doing well. Thoughts and prayers to you. Or thoughts, thoughts with you and yours. Thank you very much. Uh, Joshua Bishop, thanks for the membership. Peter, hello, thank you. Sean Cummings, stream is blocked in restricted mode. Go SpaceX. Stream is blocked in restricted mode. What the heck does that even mean? Um, hopefully that's not anything on my end. Man, does anyone else have that problem? That would be a showstopper and a bummer. Dang it. Um, anyone else? Let me know if you guys have problems, uh, with restricted mode. Uh, let's see. I'm looking in my discord. I'm not seeing anything, but maybe. Okay. Um, bah, 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 bah. blizzard photo, Tim, you're a huge reason why I like space so much. Well, thank you, blizzard. I like rockets. You know, I realized everyone, there's always the, the general term of, of liking space and people are like, Oh, I'm a huge space fan. I'm like, I mean, space is cool, but I think I mostly like rockets, actually, and and exploration. Yeah, I don't know. No, space is cool. I, I f- f- scratched that. Space is awesome, but, like, I, I think the thing that actually excites me the most and the thing that, that, that my brain thinks most about is is the actual rockets and is the physics behind all that. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know why I went on that tra- tangent. Um, Frank, how's it going? Thank you. Yay, free super chat. Yay, thank you. Um, and thanks for the memberships, uh, Ignacio and Michael. James, what makes fairings so expensive? Aluminum shell. No, they are actually carbon fiber. Um, they're actually re- a really advanced piece of machinery because they need to be um, you know, perfectly machined. This is the whole front end of the rocket, basically. So um, it's the air shell that protects the vehicle on ascent. So it needs to be able to handle a lot of structural loads. It needs to handle a lot of... Um, aerodynamic forces, a lot of aerodynamic heating, even on ascent. Um, and it needs to keep everything all together. You know, it's literally like the front of the, the vehicle. So if it collapses, that's an absolute showstopper in, in every way. Um, and they're most pri- the, the structure is primarily carbon fiber. Um, there's also sound deadening material in there. Uh, SpaceX's are probably a little more expensive than normal because they actually have little tiny attitude control thrusters inside of their fairings to, to make sure they orient themselves. Um, kind of like cuppy end down, if that makes sense. Uh, and then they also have those steerable parachutes or parafoils inside the fairing so they can be recovered and, and, and caught. Um, yeah, so reusing a fairing is actually a really big deal. It's, it, it's one of those things. This is a, a probably one of the biggest ones of like, why didn't anyone else try this forever ago? Because it really, really seems to make a lot of sense. Um, assuming that, that this all goes well. This is the first time. The good thing is, again, being that it's SpaceX, being that it's a SpaceX mission, um, say this were to not work out well, worst goes the worst, you know, it's not going to be a showstopper. Um, They'll collect data from it. Um, It's their own payload. It's their own mission. It's their own vehicle, you know, everything. So, yeah. Uh, Thanks, Replay. Um, I, he'll be good. He'll be very good. Thank you. And Tyler, thanks for the membership. And another Tyler, go Tim. Um, 60 times 60. Oh, satellites. Okay, hang on. This is a cryptic code. Tyler says, Tim, rocket to satellite times 60 to boat to star. <laughs> Money. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, and just a fun reminder here about Starlink. Basically, Starlink, in my opinion, is SpaceX printing money. Um, 2016 IAC, what was that? September something, uh, September 28th-ish or something, 2016, when they first, when Elon first got up on stage and, and revealed to the world the BFR rocket, or I guess at the, at the time it was considered the Interplanetary Interplanetary Transportation System, or ITS, um, one of the big question marks is, how do we fund this? You know, and and I guarantee at the time they already had Starlink well into development and had the idea and all that stuff figured out. So it's just funny to look back and be like, have them going like, how are we going to fund this? Starlink is how they're going to fund just about everything. So uh, just, to, ooh, SpaceX is live. Hold on here. We'll get the music just slightly in the background here. Sweet. 
I feel like it's been forever for some reason. All right, we're gonna do this. There we are. We're rolling smooth. Um, okay, and by the way, the, the size of these fairings, fairings are freaking huge. Like, here, I think the best way to, to do this is to look at, um, was to look at good old, uh, let's just look at media here. Let's see if we have any other comparisons. I think the best comparison would be um, just even when the Roadster's in there uh, for the original Falcon Heavy demo mission. Oh, I'm going to be scrolling for a while here. Oh, wait, there's that deployment. I was looking for this the other night. I was telling my friend about this. Oh, you know, these are all static images. Dang it. I want to see that cool deployment because it's it's fun to see these things deploy. Um, wait, was this a thing showing how they're going to deploy? Nope. I'm going to be scrolling for a long time if I'm going to want to see. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, that was the other Falcon Heavy. Hang on. Tesla in fairing. We'll just do that. This will probably be much easier. So this is a, you know, this is a, a human-sized car. And by the way, when did Google do this? Like, I want big images, Google. Don't give me these weird baby images off to the side. You know what I'm talking about? When did this happen? Like, I want it to fill up up there. Stop doing that. Stop it. You're making me look stupid in front of my friends. Uh, there we go. Yeah, so this is this is a normal car. Well, it's, it's a pretty small car, actually. This is, you know, the Tesla Roadster. The original Tesla Roadster is based on a Lotus Elise, which is a very small, <laughs> very small car. But it's not like it's like a shoe car. You know, this is a standard uh, Roadster sized. And... Uh, you know, you can, can you can see here how insanely big it is compared to a fairing. So a fairing is huge. Here we go. Here's another picture of a fairing. Um, it's just it's a big, big old piece of stuff, big piece of kit. So um, I don't know why that's not like loading. It looks like potatoes. So yeah, that's um, that's what a fairing actually looks like, and it's kind of just hard to remember how massive those things are and why they're so freaking expensive. So um let's see 3d fix um good question that's all automated actually um it should be linked discord links it to patreon uh there's like a bot a script bot that will send it to your email or in integrate to your email so make sure whatever email you used on on patreon is the same one that you're trying to sign in or create an account with with discord and then they'll be smoothly integrated um does anyone else have any advice on that in discord because I'm actually totally hands off on that. That's and that's kind of the point is to be hands off so that a robot handles it instead of me trying to be like, okay, here's your permissions, you know. Um, yeah, let. Uh, it's okay, Flo. We're okay, man. We'll we'll get. It. They'll tell us the exact weights. We'll be good. Um, yeah, there's also mission control audio. I think that's really interesting. Um, yeah. Okay, so Jason, let's see. Um, so let me know, 3D Fix. I'll, I'll check my, my patron messages today and and make sure that we get it figured out. But hopefully that integration works okay. Let me know if not, and I'll try to do something in the back end. Um, Jason Silva, what happens to the second stage after deployment? The second stage after deployment uh, ends up eventually doing a little reversal and deorbiting itself. And then it splashes down actually they even show where it will splash down because that's actually also an exclusion zone for airplanes and shipping um so uh I, it typically splashes down i believe in the indian ocean so and not splash down most of it won't make it back down to earth at all so it'll just burn it up on re-entry and that's that's what happens is, is they intentionally deorbit it and again that's pretty normal for any low earth orbit mission is to deorbit space debris so we don't have stages just hanging out all willy-nilly um get it down out of there right away so yeah let's see hopefully that answers that. i should do a mission about well i, I am going to be talking about space debris in, in an upcoming video hopefully before the end of the year but at this pace god no <laughs> uh Dirdre, thank you for the membership jeff hurst um a few webcasts ago my son tom told you he had applied at spacex on a later webcast i told you you got the job this morning he'll be viewing the launch in hawthorne just outside mission control that is freaking awesome congrats jeff uh and congrats tom really for having a job and being right there in mission control as we speak that is so cool i love that that's actually happening um i'll get to, back to the guys uh, sumit and colby um thank you guys 
Um, I'll get guys back to you guys in a second, but I want to listen in here because we, we always catch a lot of fun, juicy little details here um, when the presenters come on and, and, and tell us all the facts. And we'll get the facts straight about the weights and all those things too. So um, let's listen in. You are looking at a live view of the Falcon 9 as it awaits its target at 9.56 a.m. Eastern Time launch from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. Good morning. It's November 11th here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. My name is Lauren Lyons, and I'm an engineer on the Starlink team here at SpaceX. In honor of Veterans Day, we would like to take a moment to express our deepest gratitude to all our veterans at SpaceX and to those across the country who have served. Thank you for all that you've done and all that you continue to do. Every launch is an exciting launch, but today's launch represents some particularly notable milestones for SpaceX. First, today's launch will be the first time we're reflying a Falcon 9 booster for the fourth time. This booster previously flew on Iridium 7, Salcom 1A, and PSN 6. Following today's flight, we'll be attempting to recover it for a fourth time on our drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You, out in the Atlantic Ocean. Second, this is the first time we'll be flying a recovered fairing. This fairing previously flew on the Falcon Heavy Arabsat mission earlier this year. And last but not least, of course, we'll be launching another 60 Starlink satellites to orbit. These 60 new satellites will make Starlink one of, if not the largest star s satellite constellation to date. We'll talk more about these new satellites later on in the webcast. Lots of exciting stuff going on for today's mission, but let's take a closer look at Falcon 9 on the pad. Right now, we are looking at a live view of Falcon 9, our 70-meter two-stage liquid-fueled launch vehicle. The bottom two-thirds of the vehicle is the first stage, and this is what accelerates the vehicle through the Earth's atmosphere to the edge of space with the help of nine Merlin engines. Today, we're going to be flying this first stage for a fourth time and also attempting its fourth recovery on our drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You, which is currently stationed about 340 nautical miles northeast of the Cape, off the coast of Charleston, South Carolina. Above the first stage is the second stage, which has a single Merlin vacuum or MVAC engine, and that engine ignites after the first stage separates. The second stage is what will carry the Starlink satellites to an altitude of 280 kilometers above the Earth's surface. And from there, over the course of the next few weeks, the satellites will use their onboard Krypton propulsion system to move up to their operational altitude of 550 kilometers. Now the stack of those 60 Starlink satellites is safely tucked away inside the 17-foot diameter payload fairing, which is that part at the very top. Once we reach the vacuum of space, we will jettison the fairing as the second stage continues on its journey to orbit. And as I mentioned earlier, we are flying our very first reuse fairing, which is super cool because this is the first time anyone that we're aware of has ever attempted to refly a fairing. And for those of you who follow us, you know we've been working towards this milestone for a while, so we're super excited to finally try it. Now, we're not going to attempt to catch the fairing halves today as originally planned because the team had some concerns about stress to the ships in high seas prior to launch, but we're planning to retrieve the halves once they, splend, once they splash down in the ocean. So again, there's lots of activity today, so let's check in with Jesse for a status update. My name is Jesse Anderson, and I'm a lead manufacturing engineer here at SpaceX. All is looking good for an on-time launch of today's exciting Starlink mission. Falcon 9 rolled out to the pad with the payload last night and went vertical this morning. The chief engineer held a technical pull at T-1 hour, and the launch director held a propellant load and launched Go No Go pull at T-38 minutes. Falcon 9 has been loading propellants since T-35 minutes, and currently our rocket-grade kerosene, or what we call RP-1, is nearly fully loaded on the first stage, and the second stage is already fully loaded. Liquid oxygen loading is currently underway on both stages. At T minus seven minutes, engine chill will begin. This is where we allow a small amount of the super chilled liquid oxygen to flow into the Merlin engine turbo pumps prior to the full flow of liquid oxygen into the vehicle to avoid any shocks to the system. Finally, at T minus four and a half minutes, the transporter erector will retract away from the rocket slightly, and that'll provide clearance for Falcon 9 to lift off of the launch pad. As for the spacecraft, the Starlink satellites remain powered down until just after separation from the second stage, which will occur roughly an hour after liftoff. 
Interesting. If you watched our first satellite launch, then you may recall that the Starlink satellites are stacked flat on top of each other and then are released simultaneously during payload deploy, followed by orbit raising. Mm. Prior to orbit raise, SpaceX engineers will conduct data reviews to ensure the Starlink satellites are operating as intended. As we noted prior to the launch, we're keeping an eye on one of the satellites that may not orbit raise. If for any reason a satellite is not performing as expected, SpaceX will deorbit the spacecraft. The components of each satellite are fully demisable and are expected to quickly burn up in the Earth's atmosphere, a measure that exceeds all current safety standards. That's new. Once the health checkouts are complete, the satellites will then use their onboard ion thrusters powered by Krypton to propel themselves to an altitude of 350 kilometers. Now let's take a look at the weather. And it looks like we have some great weather this morning over there in Cape Canaveral. There's a very small chance of showers and some clouds with only a 20% chance of launch violation. So we will continue to monitor this all the way down to T minus zero to ensure the, that the weather remains good for launch, but it's looking great over there. The Air Force range is prepared to support today's mission. Waters are clear of any ships and the range continues to ensure the safety of our launch. We are continuing to count down to liftoff, but if for any reason we do have to call a hold on today's launch, we have a backup opportunity tomorrow, November 12th at 9.34 a.m. Eastern Time. But at this time, all systems are go for an on-time liftoff approximately eight minutes from now. So for those of you who don't already know, Starlink is SpaceX's effort to bring high-speed, low-latency broadband internet to people across the globe. Particularly, particularly to areas where connectivity has been unreliable, too expensive, or completely unavailable. Most satellite internet services today come from geostationary satellites, and those are single satellites that orbit the planet at about 35,000 kilometers, covering a fixed region above the Earth. Starlink is a constellation of multiple satellites that orbit the planet at about 550 kilometers and cover the entire globe. And because they're in such a low orbit, the round-trip data time between the user and the satellite, also known as latency, is much faster than with satellites that are in geostationary orbit. Additionally, each satellite performs autonomous collision avoidance maneuvers throughout its lifetime so that they don't run into each other, run into each other to create space debris. This is the first constellation to have this advanced capability. In addition, each satellite is fully demisable, meaning at the end of life, the satellite's components are expected to burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. Low Earth orbit satellite constellations at this scale are incredibly difficult to build, but the performance of those initial 60 satellites that we launched back in May has been very promising. In fact, just a couple weeks ago, Elon sent a tweet using the Starlink network for the first time. We still have a ways to go from tweets to 4K cat videos, but we are on our way. Our goal is to start offering service in the northern United States and Canada as soon as next year, expanding to a global constellation after an expected 24 launches. Now, the team responsible for this enormous task is largely based in Redmond, Washington. The Redmond team, along with their counterparts across the company, there they are. Look at our team. <laughs> Hi, guys. The Redmond team, along with their counterparts across the company, have implemented a number of upgrades for today's mission, including doubling the number of steerable phase array broadband beams, a 400% increase in data throughput per satellite, Ooh. and the inclusion of a new KA band antenna system. Between the satellite upgrades, the first reflight of, the, of a fairing today, and this being the first reflight, or sorry, the first fourth flight of a Falcon 9, there's a ton of cool stuff happening on today's mission with liftoff just a few minutes from now. Currently four and a half minutes from liftoff, Falcon 9 is moving into the final stages of the countdown. The first and second stages are both nearly fully loaded with one million pounds of kerosene fuel and liquid oxygen. First stage should finish propellant loading at T minus three minutes and second stage at T minus two minutes. At T minus 60 seconds, be sure to listen in to the call out for Falcon 9 in startup. This means that the rocket's autonomous internal flight computers have taken over the launch countdown. The Starlink payloads continue to be healthy. The Falcon 9 team is tracking no issues on the rocket. Weather is still looking amazing and the range is green for launch. So let's go listen in to the countdown. Man, <laughs> it's so crazy. I love 
you know, they're continually loading fuel until basically the very last second on this on this vehicle. That's because they do super chill the RP1 until it basically gets down almost to not quite to, to freezing, to, but it uh, they get it down as cold as they can so it's as dense as possible. Also, it, or performs as well as possible, at least for the RP1. But the liquid oxygen actually does get more dense uh, the colder and colder you get it. So it actually, they increase a, hand, a decent amount of performance by doing their super chilled propellants. Uh, it's it's interesting today. You don't see as much condensation. It does appear to be more on the back side of the rocket. But remember, when a rocket is sitting there, there you can see, even though it's really foggy shot, uh, looks like there's some condensation on that lens. But you can see uh, you can see these little clouds pouring off. That's where they're venting, and and they're showing right now that the, the strong back retracting. It has these little claws that kind of hold everything tight, um, and they're going to retract just a few degrees because these strong backs do fly back. The thing that holds the rocket vertical at liftoff gets very far away from the rocket so that it does less damage to the components and to the actual, um, you know, the plumbing that, that the umbilicals and things that are plugged into the rocket um, before liftoff. So now so now you can see the condensation pouring off here. And that's because this vehicle, if you went up and touched it, your hand would, would probably freeze right now. Um, it's unbelievably cold. You know, that is liquid oxygen is, is like minus 200 centigrade. It's very, 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 very cold. Um, and so obviously that makes the aluminum skin very cold. And then when air comes in contact with that very cold, just like sometimes when you open your freezer, you might notice some condensation, um, you know, little clouds pouring out or uh, dry ice and things like that. You'll notice those little, that little fog. It's the same thing happening here. And you will notice a, a kind of a continual vent coming out of the black interstage and also from the top, That's, that is um, purging. That's, they intentionally vent the lines and, and vent the tanks because as liquid oxygen warms up, it turns back into a gas. And when it does so, it expands almost a thousand it's times. Close, close down. So in order to make it so you know you don't <laughs> rupture your tanks, you have to have it venting and, and vent out as it does expand. So that's normal. Um, this is all looking very nominal. Look at how used that booster is. This booster, again, has been used. It's already gone to space. So basically anything below the black part um, so the bottom two thirds of this vehicle has already gone to space and back and landed and is now being reflown. So this is the fourth flight of this actual booster, which is absolutely incredible. Um, and they're hoping to get at least 10 flights out of these block five boosters. So <laughs> they're going to be pushing the limits, I think on their, on their own internal Starlink missions. That's for sure. So I can't wait. Yes. Um, Let's see here. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. Oh yeah, so again, congrats to Jeff and Tom. Mostly Tom for getting a job, but Jeff for having a son that works at SpaceX. That's awesome. Uh, Colby, hi Tim. Thanks Colby for saying hi. Alex Alexander, uh, thank you for making space more accessible. You're power. welcome. That's what I like to do. Uh, TT Trouble, very cool work, keep it up. I will aim that at SpaceX, they're the ones doing the awesome work. Um, I'm just here to help try to answer your guys' questions and put some things into context because some of this stuff can be very confusing. So the vehicle is totally closed off now and you'll see um, that it is now, they're venting the lines and things that were um, used to fill the, the rocket a second ago, just making sure that it's all purging appropriately. So you do see a big extra cloud of of, uh, of oxygen there, which is cool. I wonder what it'd be like to breathe that in besides very, very, very cold and <laughs> would literally burn your skin from being so cold. You'd get like instant, <laughs> uh, what's that called? Oh, can I just in startup? Oh baby, startup mode, here we go. I love it. Okay, so uh, Kenny K, thank you so much. Uh, Master Maze Productions, hello from Toronto. Nerding out about space and science has been my dad and my favorite thing, bonding thing to do for years. And today he'll be watching the LBS launch. go for launch. From your parents' hotel in Florida. That's awesome. Well, I hope your dad has fun seeing a, a, a rocket launch. They're really fun in person. I need to do an updated version on where to where to watch launches from in Florida, 30 seconds. Uh, Texas, and and also in. Uh, in California and eventually all the launch major launch sites around the world. I need to do a, a, another guide to all those. But yes, if you haven't ever seen a launch in person, you definitely need to. There's something incredible about it, especially if you happen to catch a launch that does come back and return to launch site landing. Ten, <laughs> That's nine, amazing. Okay, let's let's eight, listen in here. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition, 
lift off with there gratitude to our veterans today and always go USA. <laughs> Okay, let's see if this fairing holds up. Oh yeah, happy Veterans Day. Falcon 9 is pitching down range. Stage 1 prop is nominal. Is nominal. Looking good. Max Q, once it makes it through Max Q, that fairing's good. Then the we pressure gets. We are T plus 55 seconds into launch, and we've had a on time Falcon liftoff Supersonic. and a beautiful view of the Falcon 9 vehicle making its way to orbit. We are coming up in about 10 seconds here on Max Q. That is the maximum aerodynamic pressure that the vehicle will see during ascent. We should be able to hear that call Vehicles out. Vehicles experiencing maximum aerodynamic pressure. And there's that call out for Max Q. Coming up next is a rapid succession of events, starting off with main engine cutoff, or what we call MECO, followed immediately by stage separation. That's the separation of the first stage from the second stage. And then seconds after will be the lighting of our second stage engine, which we call second engine startup, or SES-1. That is coming up here in about 45 seconds. And back engine chill. Okay, so now the atmosphere is thinner We've got a great thinner. view this morning with some pretty clear blue skies, the earth in the background. Now watch on the left, that sky's gonna get blacker and blacker very quickly as altitude increases. And don't and forget the rocket. If you're just now joining us, we are 30 seconds away from main engine cutoff, stage separation, and SES-1. So, yeah, don't forget, and the only reason rockets go up is to get out of the atmosphere. The main way you actually get into orbit is by going horizontal to the Earth's surface. You have to get up to about 17,000. What you 000. see on your screen, you should be able to see the stages separate. 500 mile an hour. 10 seconds here. 27,000 kilometers an hour. You have to go very fast, and so they have to get up. So they just get up. They only go up to get out of the atmosphere. And after that, it's mostly just straight up horizontal movement. They kind of pitch over. Miko. Here we go, Miko's. Stage suppression confirmed. All right. There, as you saw on your left screen, we had Miko and stage separation. On your right screen, we should see that second engine startup. Now watch this niobium nozzle will start glowing red because it just radiates And there's that away. second stage engine glowing bright red. And that's just the Coming up next extension. in about 30 Sorry. seconds is fairing deployment. Now a reminder, this, is, this fairing is being flown for a second time, which is a first in SpaceX history. And what you can see on your screen, on the left screen, those grid fins have been deployed. Let's see it, baby. And there is our fairing Sorry, deployment. Okay. This is the first reflight of our fairing. So such an exciting mission this morning already. That's awesome. That's a big deal. That's about a $6 million savings right there. Five or $6 million, something <laughs> definitely, definitely worth trying to, trying to reuse. As the second stage continues to orbit with those 60 Starlink satellites on top, stage one is making its way home for the fourth time. That's crazy. The stage one is going to execute two burns before hopefully it's standing there on our drone ship. The first one will be the entry burn, which occurs at about T plus six minutes and 23 seconds, so a little over two minutes from now. That's where we're going to relight three of those Merlin engines and slow the vehicle down such that it can safely re-enter the atmosphere. From there, the booster will coast for just under a minute and a half and then execute what is called the landing burn. That is where we're going to reignite this, a single engine, that E9 engine right in the middle of the booster, slowing the vehicle down to zero velocity, hopefully standing right there up on the drone ship. Meanwhile, stage two continues to fly nominally. We're hearing that MVAC-D power is nominal. It continues at full power. Stage two pressures. The tank pressures are nominal as well. 
first and second stage are on a nominal trajectory. Sweet. So, fun little reminder about the, on the right side, you're seeing the upper stage engine. That's the Merlin 1D vacuum. Just over vacuum. a minute away from that entry burn. And notice, you can kind of see that stage position. Stage one. From the, uh, Meanwhile, stage one continues to make its way down. Um, and I'm just going to do this so I don't talk over somebody. Um, so you, you'll notice that little like snail looking thing kind of uh, right before the nozzle gets uh, kind of red and gray, uh, like a shiny looking snaily thing that wraps around it. That's where they pump in the turbo pump uh, exhaust. So th there's the pre or not the pre burner. There's the gas generator exhaust. And that's actually cooler than the exhaust coming out of the combustion engine, the main engine. And so they actually pipe that that relatively cool, although it's still really, really hot, they actually pipe that into the, the nozzle. And I talk about that in that video about aerospike engines and how you can cool um, rockets and rocket parts. But you can actually see how that's, that's considered film cooling. And they use film cooling from the gas generator to make sure that nozzle doesn't melt. But then it's also made, of, made out of niobium, which has a really high melting point, And it just radiates the heat away. So here we go. We're coming up on, on entry burn. Man, that's still so cool. So you're ready Stage on the one entry burn. And as you see, that entry burn has begun. Should go for another five seconds or so. Stage one entry burn shut down. I love watching it. And you just heard we now. had a successful shutdown of that entry burn. So for about another minute and a half, stage one is going to coast, making its way down to the drone ship. And at First T plus, and second stage continue to follow a nominal trajectory. And now you'll see that's pretty normal. It will cut In out quite a bit. In just under a minute, that landing burn should start. I love watching the first stage actually enter and using the grid fins to steer it and point it at the drone ship or the landing pad, depending on where it's landing. Man, they just have it nailed down so well now. Stage one transonic. So it already is going subsonic already as it's transitioning from supersonic to subsonic. So there'd be a sonic boom coming up here. Everything continues to be nominal on stage two. And in just under 10 seconds, that landing burn should start. Hopefully we'll get some nice on-vehicle video. Let's see if they're able to pull up. Stage one in. landing burn. We don't have that video just yet, but that landing burn has started. Second stage has entered terminal guidance. Stage one landing will deploy. It looks like we're not going to get video on the way down. Oh, but we have the drone ship. And wow, nice. the Falcon has landed that for the, the fourth video. time. That was the best video that they've ever had. Amazing. These boosters are designed to be used 10 times. Let's turn it around for a fifth, guys. Wow. Right on the freaking bullseye. Wow. God. Fourth landing. That is super <laughs> cool. So stage two, I believe uh, we have Ooh, had green. Seco one. Um, we're going to enter a coast phase. Um, so to, before we do that, we're going to take a quick break. Sorry, it's very exciting over here. <laughs> and, uh, as we leave, we're going to have an animation that shows you where we are in the coast phase. But we're going to be back here at T plus 44 minutes. All right, we'll be back at T plus 44 minutes for a second stage relight, followed up by payload deploy. So come on back. I think the world's ending over here for me. Um, yes. Okay, so uh, let's maybe do a little recap. So that that was, I, I cannot, okay, this is a great feed actually right here. So you can see all the work, hang on, let me go a little me again. Uh, you can see how much work the first stage did. That's all the first stage actually does. So in other words, if the second stage didn't light, guess what? The second stage would go right there too. 
Uh, so that's why, you know, with the whole rocket equation thing where you do want to split your rockets up because you basically start off with a brand new fresh baby rocket or the second stage that's fully fueled, um, has a, a vacuum optimized engine and can, can light from there and actually kick the thing into orbit. So this gives you a good representation here of how much work the first stage does, but also actually how much work that second stage does. And it's mostly, it's purely really just horizontal velocity. It's just speeding up enough to never hit the ground. You know, that's all orbit is, is basically going fast enough that as gravity pulls you down, you're also going just perfectly the right speed to keep going forward. So as you're basically just constantly falling around the earth and that's really all orbit is. And there's that second stage. Look how fast it's going. Can you imagine being on that thing? Wow. But I loved, we actually got to see the, the landing burn. We actually saw it from the drone ship. Normally that doesn't happen. You know, normally we have those downlink problems. They have been working really hard on some solutions. Um, they can't really bounce. They can't really normally shoot their satellite feed back up into space from the drone ship because you have a rocket coming in landing, shooting, literally shooting plasma and flames down at the satellite dish. And so that vibrates, it shakes, it causes all sorts of interference, which includes interference, even shooting it um, off to other, you know, other platforms and stuff. And there's been talk of using like different Omni dishes and bouncing those signals literally off the ocean, being collected by, uh, by the support boat. The problem is the support boats like 16 kilometers away or 10 miles away to be in the safe zone. So that's actually over the curve of the earth. So they can't even see, you know, they don't have a direct line of sight, which you need to have for the radio uplink. There's all these different technical issues, but they've been working on some new solutions, I think. And today we just got, that's, I think that's the first time we've really just seen without any significant cut, a straight up landing, which is just awesome. So congrats SpaceX team for that. That is awesome. Uh, yeah. So now we're just coasted. Now we just get to hang out. Um, yeah, uh, would uh, Chad wants to know if Newfoundland would see stage two now in the right lighting conditions? Yes, if it's if it's lit up, if it's burning, sometimes you can see it. Not most of the time, not during the day though. If it's night and it's still lighting, yes, um, the East Coast probably could have seen the upper stage fly. And then if it's dark and if it's dark on the ground but bright, you know, like say the sun just set thirty minutes ago or something, lots of times you might see a glimmer from like the the second stage if you were looking in the right area. Yeah. So, um, yeah, sweet. So we have like 30 minutes. Uh, I wanted to remind you guys before the holiday season here, we have updated the shop big time. Uh, we got a lot of things back in stock. Um, yeah. So Starman hoodie, unfortunately is sold out and I probably just need to remove it from the store cause it is like gone for probably ever. Uh, don't forget on the web store, we do have free domestic shipping on orders over $100 and discounted international shipping on orders over hundred, because I know how expensive that international shipping is. I actually lose money on international shipping uh, on orders over hundred because it's, it's just so expensive and I don't know what we can do better, but we're trying, but we do have restock on the aerospike engine. The full flow shirt is finally back in stock um, and back in stock for good. Um, I believe the aerospike, if the aerospike isn't, isn't in today. Oh, it is. Okay. Oh, okay. I, we're literally putting it in like this week. So if you want the aerospike engine, um, sure. It will be back in stock like any day. Uh, the prints were just finishing up because we do runs on prints. Um, but we are stocked up on the F1 shirt. We even are, believe it or not, we do have our last run of grid finale coasters that I'll be putting up in the shop, um, this week as well. So, um, yeah, so we're trying to stay on top of things. I think there's still also a few more. I did a, f a limited run of signed edition of, of some pictures. The other version sold out right away, the other Starhopper one. But I did hand sign some of these, so this could be a, a fun gift for the holidays if you guys want. Um, everydayastronaut.com slash shop. And don't forget, guys, I do have the rapid unscheduled uh, discount section now. It looks like most stuff might be sold out. But um, I'll, I'll probably pack a few more things in there for, um, for Black Friday. That's coming up soon already. Um, we'll, but we'll, we just kind of clear up old inventory in there. So, you know, grab some of the stuff while it's still in there. And of course, if you are in the aerospace industry, you can take 25% off anything in the apparel here. That's, that's not sold out, <laughs> which I think we're doing okay on stock on most of the stuff. Anyway, um, if you work in the aerospace industry, click here, you put your email in your, your work email, 
it'll shoot you an email back. So don't try making up an email. I see people being like Elon Musk at SpaceX.com and then like it'll shoot me a thing and I just laugh and go, you guys, that's not how this works. Like you have to have that email yourself, you know, Elon Musk at SpaceX.com. Yeah, like I'm just going to be like, oh, it looks like that's an approved email. Here you go. <laughs> this is as a thank you for those of you that do work in the aerospace industry. Um, I just want to thank you for what you do. You inspire me to do what I do. You teach me <laughs> what I know. Like I've learned everything just because of the aerospace industry. Um, so yeah, so if you work in the aerospace industry, most domains are approved, like uh, .gov domains um, and things like that too, or at least, you know, NASA.gov um, and a few other, you know, obviously like Boeing and ULA and Rocket Lab and, and Northrop Grumman, a lot of these aerospace companies who do have approved. There's a few obscure ones out there, um, but yeah, that, that's again, just as my thank you to you. Yeah, so there we go. Let's answer a few more of you guys' questions. Um, Chris, I, 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 sorry, I don't want to make this a, a show. I want to stick to aerospace, but I do really appreciate the thoughts for my dad. He's doing well. He will have surgery this week. Hopefully, um, I talked a lot about it earlier in the show, so we might have to go back and watch that. But thank you, Chris. Um, he'll do good. He'll be good. Um, Air, uh, Apuru, Apur, Apurv, um, keep up the good work, man. I love your channel. Hello from India. Awesome. Thank you. I really want to visit India someday. I really do. I would love to see ISRO. So if you work for the I, for ISRO and can help me get a cool tour, I would love to do that because I want to do a video all about ISRO and why they're probably going to be, you know, catching up, if not succeeding and being definitely one of the major, they're already kind of one of the major space players, but they're catching up really, really quickly. Um, so if you work it for, for ISRO and want, uh, and have the ability to give me some access to some cool things, I would love to come out and check it out and do a really in-depth rundown. Um, yeah, that'd be so cool. Uh, Bailey, thank you for your devotion and con continually inspiring all of us through your attention to detail and passion about space. Well, thank you, Bailey kind of can't help it. How, how can you not be excited about this stuff? Um, I mean, we just watched a, a rocket fly for the fourth time that a, 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 a giant piece of rocket, 15 stories tall, that's normally just discarded, you know, a $20 million piece of hardware flew for the fourth time. We just saw fairings that cost about $6 million. They can fit a school bus inside them that is made entirely out of carbon fiber and all these expensive materials that normally cost five or $6 million. We just saw those be reused. I mean, how are we not living? And now we're gonna watch 60 freaking satellites deploy out of like 12,000 or 40,000 or whatever the new number is that keeps changing to provide global internet for anyone around the world. I mean, we are living in extremely exciting times, just plain bonkers. So thank you, Bailey. Um, Jason, thank you so much for the membership. Evan, point to hand up, flame me hand down, hashtag team Russ. Happy Veterans Day. Thank you. I know my dad will appreciate that. I, I think they're, my parents are watching right now. So, uh, yeah, Team Russ. Um, well, thank you very much, ETQ, with the, the longest. I hope that's not your password to something. I hope you didn't accidentally mix up your password and your username because <laughs> that's really funny. But thank you very much. Um, Cracks or 85, thank you. Uh, Let's see, uh, Dhruv Mishra, thank you so much. And Cracks again, thank you very much. Cracks again, 10987654321. Love your channel, Tim. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm trying to keep up with you guys. Sometimes it does that thing where it just gets out of order. Come on. Night Fox, thanks for everything you do, Tim. Best wishes uh, for your dad from Japan. That's uh, the other place. I really want to, maybe I'll do both of those. Maybe I'll do India and Japan in the same trip because I'll probably end up having to do a layover in you know, Tokyo or Beijing or somewhere in Eastern Asia in order to get over to India. Um, it's a soul. I feel like every time I go to Asia, I've, I fly into Seoul, like almost no matter what, but anyway, back to Japan. Uh, yeah, I would love to, uh, I would love to visit Japan too and, and check out the, the, uh, the launch complex there and everything, the Mitsubishi rockets. And that'd be awesome. It looks like a really pretty launch site. Hernan, how's it going? Thank you so much. I appreciate the flying pair. <laughs> uh, Jeffrey trip. Uh, got permission to ditch out of class 10 minutes early to watch the launch. <laughs> Hope your father is all good. That is awesome, Jeffrey. You have a cool teacher. That's great. Uh, Craig C. Instructions unclear. Tongue stuck to rocket. <laughs> Do not lick a rocket while it's fully fueled. Again, it is unbelievably cold and it would be a very <laughs> bad idea. Oh, yeah. Um, it's probably not quite dark yet, but dang it if, it, if it was about two or three hours later, Right now, if you lived in Dublin or coming up on London, 
uh, you'd likely see, you might actually see a glimmer of the upper stage. And actually coming up here, hey, those of you in, in Austria and stuff, Flo and all you other guys in, in, in kind of uh, middle of Europe there, get ready. You actually might be able to, if it's a clear night, step outside and look northwest. Or wait, maybe just straight north for you. You might actually see this baby fly by. Because it's getting, that's kind of right where it's going to be dusk. And it would still be illuminated by the sun. Do it. It's too foggy. Dang it. All right. Well, if you live in, if you live over there, step outside for me. Let me know if you see it. That's awesome. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, El Elmar, uh, basically an RP1 slushy with locks chaser. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. That's, that'd be an awesome drink. Oh, not really. Don't drink that. Don't drink RP1, guys. Oh, God. Why did I say that? Okay, that'd be a fun, interesting themed drink. <laughs> Do not drink RP1. I mean, you can have locks, only you'll not have a... You probably wouldn't have a whole face if you tried to drink locks because it'd be so cold, it'd shatter your face. So don't do that either. God, I'm giving horrible advice this morning. Um, <laughs> Summit says, Tim, this is much better than Aerospike. I don't know. I mean, Aerospikes are cool, but yeah, they're not cool enough. Or literally, they're not cool enough. They get really hot, and they have to make a lot of compromises to not make it melt. Oh, wow. thank you so much. Um, I really wish I could say your name, <laughs> but thank you. Um, Kotchkitin? I'm sorry. I have no idea. Um, Dylan, uh, will we get less of these breakups with Starlink? <sighs> we might get different uplink abilities, but the ability to uplink is still the hard part because it's actually the satellite dish that gets shaken. But maybe they'll have other solutions once Starlink is out. Like Maybe it will make sense to have a closer autonomous drone ship or something. I don't know. Who knows? But remember, any of these solutions, you guys, you know, when people would complain, why don't they just make a buoy and a system and all these and a drone uplink? All of this would be to have like five seconds of an uninterrupted video. And what value does that have to SpaceX? Nothing, because all that stuff is locally filmed. So they have video footage of it themselves and they have the data to be able to know when the vehicle lands. So having a video of it is just completely secondary and ancillary and quite, quite frankly, 100% unnecessary. That's only for our pleasure. So they should not spend anything more than about $20 for our viewing pleasure, right? You know, that keep that in mind. The grand scheme of things, that little five second interruption that we sometimes have and didn't have today, uh, <laughs> is that worth them putting anything more than a, a couple thousand dollars into? You know, uh, they've had options of planes and stuff like that, but that's, you know, we're talking half a million dollars or a million dollars or several, a non- you might as well hire some engineers for five years instead of trying to get those five seconds of video back. Um, just just keep that in mind. But it looks like they have a pretty good solution now, so hopefully it just gets better and better. Um, Paniz, that landing was beautiful. That was really, really epic, actually. Um, Sumit, thank you again for the flying pair. <laughs> Becoming a pretty big fan of that. Um, Sumit, what about the fairing? I feel like we talked a decent amount about the fairing. Um, I hope I answered your questions. It is, it is still going to splash down and hopefully they'll maybe be able to retrieve them, but I wouldn't be surprised if this time they don't even attempt to retrieve them since, since the two fairing recovery ships are gone. Um, we also need to talk about, they, they did mention that one of the satellites was defunct already or likely not going to work. So think about, this is interesting. We're living in a time where it's cheaper for them to fly right away. And instead of delaying and, and taking the, the fairing apart and unlinking, you know, in that stack of satellites, it's cheaper them to fly it and have one fail. And actually it's probably a good thing that they can test one that's failed and make sure it can burn up on re-entry as it's intended. But it's, it's cheaper for them to do that than it is to unstack it and, and, and fix the satellite. So that's the scale of economy they're working with um, or the economies of scale. So these satellites must be, you know, relatively inexpensive. Pretty crazy that they can just be like, you know, this one's broken, but eh, whatever. It's going to be one of thousands, you know. So um, don't forget, every time one of these launches, and they're hoping to launch 24 of these missions next year with 60 satellites in each of them. That's crazy. Yeah. And they're just going to keep improving these satellites over and over and over and making the constellation more and more powerful until you can be anywhere on the globe, basically, and have legit streaming abilities and even gaming abilities because that's the thing is latency becomes a big issue 
um, especially geostationary orbit, you start to get into the hundreds of seconds of ping, like 200, 300, 400, 500 ping, milliseconds, uh, sorry, milliseconds of ping. I don't remember exactly um, how bad it is for geostationary orbit, but I believe it's somewhere like, uh, you know, four or 500 milliseconds. And that is way too long of latency to do things like online gaming. So having a low earth orbit internet constellation will allow you to even do things like internet gaming, you know, uh, or online gaming. I shouldn't say internet gaming. Inter using the internet games. Uh, no, online gaming, so you'd still be able to do, you know, you could sit there and play, I don't know, Call of Duty or something on an airplane. That'd be pretty awesome. Uh, Kerbal 2 online when it's multiplayer. I could be on an airplane, on an international flight, and be playing online, which, I mean, that's insane. Um, I think in about five years, that'll be totally normal. I think even in about two years, it'll become more available, but you would, it would need to have a receiver on the plane. It's not going to be something that's, you know, usable for our devices locally. Uh, like you won't be able to just like take your phone out and be like, here we go. I'm going to uplink to Starlink. You have to have basically a pizza box size receiver, but airplanes could of course have, you know, receiver on the airplane like they do now for, for their internet services, but you'll have low latency and much higher bandwidth too. So yeah. Um, Alan McDonald, thank you so much. Felix, um, Tim, the second stage view shows two curvatures. Why? So there's there's two different cameras. They're basically 180 degrees from each other. Um, let's see here. And they're 100. So like, let's say one's on the side with the with the handle. The other one would be over here. And those cameras are very fisheye. They're they're not um, rectilinear. They they do not keep lines straight. So even a curved line, so so if it's right down the middle, uh, anything in the very center of that frame uh, would be straight. Anything above that will start to curve this way. Anything below that line will curve the other way. So if you have a curved line, like the curve of the Earth, then even if it's right den down the middle of the frame, that'll show a little bit curved. But as, say, the, say, you know, the stage is pointed down a little bit, and that is into the frame that it'll curve a lot. It, it can curve like what will look like a huge arc, even if it's uh, not to the point where you'd actually see the full arc. Um, the same is true on the, so you say you're starting with a little curve like this, and if you go below the horizon, it'll actually straighten it out and eventually it'll actually invert it, depending on where in that fish eye lens. And you can do this with, with a wall, you know, or like a, um, you know, anything, any straight line, take like a GoPro and move it up and down and you'll see it you know, you'll see it do something like that. Um, and it just exaggerates those curves a lot and or makes straight lines curvy, makes curvy lines curvier or inverted curves. Uh, so if it would be interesting to get an extremely wide angle rectilinear lens up there, um, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. Um, the deploy is at T plus 45. So we're still about 15, 18 minutes 17 minutes away from that. So, yeah. Uh, hopefully that answers your question, Felix. That's a really good question. Um, Braden, thank you so much. Chris, when will the gold Aerospike shirts be shipped? Those should have been shipped a while ago. Um, Chris, are you... If you're in the U.S., I, th I think most people have gotten theirs already. I'll double check with the shop. That seems way too late. Um, hmm. They should have definitely been shipped. Let me follow up my sh with my shop today. Um, Ryan, good connection because of Starlink connection. Not yet, unfortunately. I wish. Maybe soon. One option that'd be cool with Starlink is if a couple of them, say, uh, you know, I don't know, a handful of them would have cameras on them. They could put just, it wouldn't even take much of a camera. Um, just something with a pretty healthy telephoto lens. They could potentially track and get an upper stage shot or a shot of the rocket actually ascending into space. How freaking awesome will that be? Um, Especially like imagine seeing stage separation and stuff like that from a Starlink constellation. Oh, 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 oh that will be awesome. So uh, that that could be you know these could be kind of a test bed. They could put um, additional instruments on these Starlink satellites, and tracking cameras from space could be an option. So that would be amazing. Imagine watching the first Starlink or Starship launch, seeing stage separation and reentry and stuff like that from Starlink satellites. Please make that happen, please. Um, Ross, age 23, keep up the great work. Always watching your videos. Thank you so much. I have a video coming out this week, hopefully. Um, and then I'm working on like th probably three more videos to try to end out the year. Um, but I'm also 
hoping to go down for the Boeing um, OFT-1, the first test launch of Starliner, test flight of Starliner. I'm also going to watch the first Starship launch, whenever that is. It sounds like they still need to do, you know, crowd proofing of Starship. They also need to, uh, you know, probably install the three Raptors and get all the additional hardware. Maybe still this year. It might be like a New Year's Eve thing or something. Who knows? Um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully that happens really soon. Um, I'm also going to be again probably up and down between here and and where my dad is in the hospital. Um, but then I might be going to see, depending on if I get an invite, Tesla to go see the Tesla truck. I really want to see that unveiling. That will be crazy. Um, so it's going to be a busy rest of the year here for me, but I, I have a lot of work that I need to be doing. Luckily, a lot of it is scripting and researching, which I can do from anywhere. So um, anywhere with a decent internet connection. So yeah. Um, yay. Okay, let's keep reading you guys' stuff here. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Um, thank you so much, Zane, for saying hi and for watching the streams. Uh, Thomas, that booster went to space more times than most of the astronauts. That's that's very true. Thanks for the amazing coverage, Tim. You're welcome, Thomas. That's super true. That's I never even thought about that. Um, who is, as far as number of times going to space, who is the most flown astronaut? Discord, get on it. <laughs> um, Steve, thank you very much. Um, Atticus English, that's an awesome name. Appreciate the knowledge. You're welcome. Uh, Michael, how's it going? Michael Burke, uh, step two of the real real World Wide Web. Internet anywhere to everywhere, anytime. That is true. This is this is like actual World Wide Web. This is truly WWW. Um, I'm still waiting. I'm sure my Discord channel will have that figured out. Oh yeah, if you want to join our Discord channel, we have an incredible community, and I, I, I don't say that lightly. I'm not saying that as some at all sales pitch or anything. This community has been incredible, and they've helped me emotionally a lot. <laughs> I, I kind of get traumatized sometimes by like internet bullying, so they're always there to like support me and be like, "Tim, it's okay. You're okay." <laughs> like, uh, I know it sounds weird, but there's a lot of creators that kind of suffer from like mental health of of negative comments and even things that aren't negative that come off as negative that that have strange extra hard effects on on people that that read comments because I, I do think it's important to be able to read comments and, and read feedback and try and make a better video and learn something every time but yikes guys just remember when you make a comment that someone else is reading it almost no matter what and remember that they might not realize the tone so just make sure you're extra friendly even if you're giving positive feedback or even if you're giving um critiques to things you know and and correcting that's good like we we want to be pedantic and we want to be accurate but um don't say things like you idiot blah 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 or blah 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 just be like hey i noticed that you you mentioned this but perhaps it's this you know something friendly um here's a link you know like when people are just factual it's great but when you're like i can't believe you forgot this like don't say that that stuff just really that really hurts creators that will spend months on a video to have someone be like, I can't believe you're dumb enough to think. I had so many people commenting, yes, I know that hot water and cold water equals medium water. But for some reason, I had never thought about it. This hit me about three years ago with the heating thing. For some reason, I had never considered, in my head, like when things are really hot, it's just like they're really hot. <laughs> you know, like yeah, I wouldn't think about adding relative hot, you know, like our human experiences, you know, anything over like 100 degrees Fahrenheit is considered like really hot. Um, you know, so I just never thought about adding hot and hotter. What happens? It becomes the sum of the two or the, uh, the average of the two. I, I just had never thought of that. And I got so many people be like, you idiot. And then explaining the same thing, your hot water and your cold water and your tap, they mix together. And I just think I just never thought of that. Like I know now I understand this now. This is obvious now. I just had never thought of it. And I, I had never thought about you know, maybe it's because we're labeled in our, you know, in our heads, hot water, cold water equals medium water, but you know, hot water plus hot water, right? Like I just had never thought about it and that's fine. Like that's part of learning. That's why I included it in the video. I wanted you to realize that people learn and it's okay to not have a, a strong foundation of physics and science and chemistry and all these things because you can learn on the go. I'm learning, you know, I'm like a three time, four time college dropout basically. Um, I'd never, I've never taken a physics lesson in my life. I don't think, uh, I've definitely never taken a chemistry class. I might've had a physics class, one physics class in high school, but, but I'm, you know, like for me, I'm still learning a lot of these things on the go and that's great. And so should you, you should never have the attitude that you know, everything, uh, 
uh, that's that's the humility of 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 learning and, and of education is realizing oh geez i was way off on that uh let m this new base of knowledge open up another sector of knowledge for myself you know um that's why i included that in the video and i got so many people if you read the comments there's probably a thousand comments of people explaining to me how hot plus cold blah 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 and i'm like i get it now i understand you don't have to explain that to me again and i don't know why but that just always is like Read, read the comments and see if, if you see the same thing a hundred times, don't say it again. Maybe that's my, yeah. <laughs> that's my rant for the day. Tim Dodd's rant for the day. Um, Alexander, how many times do you think this booster will fly? I'm, I think, um, uh, how many times do you think this booster will fly? Uh, they, they're designed to be flown about 10 times. I think this booster might fly 10 times. We'll see. We'll see if it's worth it. At what point does it become, okay, we really have to do some significant refurbishment to this vehicle. Is that going to be worth it safety wise and worth it time and effort wise, you know? So, um, hopefully we'll see 10 flights. They're designed for 10 flights. That'd be awesome. That'd be a great milestone. Um, D Messer, hope to see Starlink over UK in its second orbit. That would be cool. That'd be really cool. Yes. If you have a clear night in Europe right now. Um, and if it's going to be in 90 minutes from now, basically, or 80 minutes from now, if it's going to be uh, dusk for you, if the sun will have set, definitely look outside and get ready. You might see that train of Starlink satellites. That would be super cool. At first, it'll basically just be a long, slightly elongated clump. And it might just be a clump at first. That's a good call. Thanks for reminding me, uh, D Messer. Jesper, thanks for your hard, thanks for your work, and good luck to your dad. Do we know of any big customers who will use Starlink? We don't know of any publicly, but I think the military has expressed interest, and there's some considerations for military usage. Um, and then I don't know, I don't know of any signed deals or anything, and I just hope that they go direct to consumer really quick. I would love to have Starlink myself, um, especially being able to take a pizza box size thing and stick it on top of my car and provide 4K coverage at at Starship events and stuff like that. Yes, please. So I really hope they go direct to consumer very, very quickly. Um, if not, if not direct to consumer, I hope that I can lease that equipment from someone else very quickly again, too. Um, cause I will be one of their very first customers. <laughs> if that's the case, uh, Panese, um, hope you had a good time in Vienna. I live in Austria, but couldn't travel from Linz. Hope to meet up with you. If you decide to come back. Absolutely. I, I think at some point in the next, we'll say 18 months, I would love to do a small U S tour and a small European tour. Um, where I just do a, a speaking thing. I'll come up with some cool presentation um, and it'll be super fun and you guys can all come hang out and it'll be super awesome. So I'm thinking about maybe like the top five cities in Europe and maybe the top like five or six or seven cities in the US too. Um, maybe I'll go beyond that someday. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I could try to, I don't think it's time to do a, a world tour or anything yet, but I, I would, I, like I said, I would love to see India. I would love to see, you know, Japan. I would love to see China's space. I would love to see Russia's space agency. Ooh, there's so much stuff to see. So much stuff to see. Okay. Um, Tim, can, can we switch to NASA's live stream of the Mercury transit? There won't be another one for 12 years. Either way, I love your work. We can do that. We, well, we have seven minutes and eh, uh, we can watch the replay. Honestly, I don't really want to miss anything here just in case. Um, but, yeah, and I'm sure we'll see plenty of good scientific data from the Mercury Transit. That is pretty cool that's happening right now, though. Um, hey, thank you so much, Kristoff, <laughs> to Japan Fund. That is awesome. I would, again, I would love to be there uh, someday for sure. Hartley, uh, do a video on why it's so hard to land on the moon. That's a good idea because there has not been, the moon has been a harsh, harsh, <laughs> a harsh old giant lately. I feel like it's, it's not been very uh, forgiving to really anyone but China. China had luck this year, um, but then Israel with their lander and India with their lander, they had some hard litho breaking. Um, yeah, it's been it's too bad. Uh, Sume, I wonder if these Starlink sats will, will reorient into a grid cluster around Earth's curvature. Uh, grid cluster around Earth's curvature. Uh, I don't quite understand your question, but yes, there will be, I mean, it'll be completely covering the entire globe. Um, and it will look like a moving mesh. It's going to be really cool. Um, a, a poor, uh, I wish I worked for ISRO, but would love to help you organize your trip to India. Okay. I'll need some help probably. Um, Arvid, 
Are they planning reusing the fairing again? I'm not sure if they'll reuse this fairing again, but for sure this will give them data for future fairing reuse. Um, especially they do have two fairing halves that have not touched the water. Have, <laughs> that have not, have not touched the water. So um, hopefully we see those be reused again. I think that was on um, STP2. And then another mission that I'm like Amos 17 or whatever. So we, we have had um, other fairings be caught and actually uh, brought back home without ever touching salt water, which is probably a pretty good idea. And we'll see we'll see whether or not even if they splash down now what what that does as, as far as whether or not they want to reuse them. I'm sure they can repurpose some of the parts though, um, even if they don't reuse the entire fairing. Good question though. Hopefully we'll find out more. Submit. Uh, let's see. Uh, 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 where did that go? It does that thing. I wonder if these Starling stats will reorient. Oh, wait. Already said that. Thanks for answering all your questions. Big love. Well, thanks, Sumit. Uh, lightning, wing, dragon, sp 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 space. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Philip, great to see uh, all the South African support for Tim's channel. That's awesome. Um, hope to see you uh, at the next open day at the uh, Heart Beast uh, Be Radio Astronomy Center. Thanks for the great content. Well, invite me. I... Depending on travel schedule and, and other things I have to be doing, I would love to come and say hi. I would love to see South Africa. Definitely on the list. Um, I definitely want to go there when it's cold here. <laughs> Victor. Hello. Thanks for your uh, work. A hug from Brazil. Thank you, Victor. Uh, drum set junkie. Keep up the great work. Speedy recovery to your dad. Thank you so much. Um, Edwin Bayer. Thank you. Leonardo. Thanks for the membership. Joshua Bishop, I've got a feeling Elon may put in some ground towers to distribute Starlink connection to Tesla vehicles and more. Any thoughts? I could definitely see them using um, at Tesla superchargers having Starlink for um, for supercharging Wi-Fi. Um, I don't know if they'll be doing ground towers. I don't think they want to set up ground towers. Think about like that cost. I think they want to avoid ground towers. Eventually, maybe as Starlink evolves, eventually they might be able to integrate Starlink into Tesla vehicles because that would be a lot cheaper than having to put up a whole infrastructure around the entire United States. Um, but I could definitely see them putting up like a small, you know, a Starlink receiver at supercharging stations and using that for their own Wi-Fi uses. That'd be pretty awesome. Sumit R. Schmucks will be shucks. Schmucks, Tim, just ignore. The problem is I can't just ignore it because I want to be able to hear feedback from my fans. I want to be able to hear feedback from anyone, whether or not they're a fan of my work or not. Um, it's important to me. That's part of how, if you watch my videos from two years ago to today, you'll notice they have changed a lot, like a lot. And I think the tone, the research, every bit of my videos is better because I've been able to listen to feedback because our Discord channel has made the videos so much better. And as people are able to catch, um, you know, problems before the videos post, they're able to help me fact check and do all these things and double check my work before it all comes out. Um, I have to listen to feedback. And so it's easy to say, it's really easy to say, ignore it. But when you have literally thousands of comments a day and some of them are just repeat over and over correcting the same thing that you already know as a mistake, you just can't ignore it. And I think that's the whole issue um, that YouTube has, uh, that's the problem with social media, period. That feedback loop, positive or negative, is a huge issue. That's not natural. That's not normal. There's no other venue in the world where even, you know, even a, a concert, if, if you're a, a, a rock star 30 years ago, you'd go in front of a stadium. You're not going to hear individual, hey, look at that guy's shirt. It's really ugly. Or, hey, did you notice that he had a, a zit? You know, like there, you don't hear individual comments that that's not normal. If you made a movie, you don't get to hear every single person that went to the movie. You don't get to hear what their thoughts were. YouTube and social media, it's different. You literally can read everything that everyone's ever said publicly about what you said. That's just, that's new, you know? And again, even if you're uh, a movie star these days, at least most of the comments about say the Avengers film won't be on your personal direct Instagram account or your Twitter feed or something. You might find it, you know, if you go out searching for reviews and stuff like that. Oh. We are having a little trouble with the video on board the vehicle, but we are still getting telemetry. So you may see that video cut in and out a little bit right now. Um, but so far we've had a on-time liftoff, completed the first reflight of a fairing, the first time that we've flown and landed a first stage booster, and we also did confirm nominal ins insertion or good orbit of the second stage. 
So coming up next is SES2 in about 20 seconds from now. Um, and this will be the shortest SES we've ever had, lasting just about one second. Wow. It's a short burn because the deployment orbit of, for these satellites isn't much different than our initial parking orbit, so we just need a quick burn to get us there. Really? That's crazy that they have that kind of control. Just a second, just pfft. Waiting for that SES-2 and SECO-2. It's going to be very quick. And Boom, and, and there boom. it is. <laughs> and second oh engine cutoff gosh. is complete. Waiting to hear for good orbit. Hopefully nominal orbital insertion. Should hear that call out in a few seconds. Nominal orbit insertion for satellite deploy. And there is the confirmation of good orbit. Now that we're in a good orbit, we'll be coasting for the next 15 minutes or so. So we will be back around T plus one hour for the exciting payload deployment of our Starlink satellites. Sweet. So I'm going to definitely stick around because I want to see that spin maneuver. They, they spin it long side. You know, and, and that's going to be definitely something to see. Um, that's funny. Okay, so um, so anyway, yeah, that that was my that was my rant again about about comment sections. <laughs> I'll stop now. Um, Evan, my dog Cassidy, not the dog in the profile picture. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, slept through the launch, even though I was cheering at it at all the major points. Dang, Cassidy, you are a light sleeper. You're supposed to be watching the house and making sure burglars don't sneak in at night and take pizza from the fridge. Come on, Cassidy. Well, tell Cassidy hi and your other dog as well. I, I'm going to go ahead and say that looks like a pretty good pup. Um, <laughs> thanks, Evan. Uh, Martin Alsop, booster landings just blow my mind. Incredible. They seriously, like, <sighs> they don't get old. And especially when we actually get to see them in real time without it cutting out. Awesome. Great work, SpaceX. You're making it look so easy and so normal. That's crazy, crazy. Um, are you guys getting a good feed? Let me double, okay, it looks like everything's up and running okay. All right, so the blue line, someone asked what the blue line is. The blue line is the next orbit. So we'll see that. Um, Cause don't forget that the orbit actually stays the same but the earth spins below it. So that's how much difference there'll be between the first and second orbit. That's how much the Earth will have spun um, relative. So yeah, hope that makes sense. <laughs> um, Stark Studios, will these Starlink sats be visible over the US? They'll be visible anywhere around the world under the right conditions, yes. Especially before they get into their fully orbital, um, into their final orbits. And as the like satellite, or as the, excuse me, solar arrays extend and things like that, you'll be able to see them better or worse under certain conditions. At first, they'll just be a train of satellites and eventually they'll all spread out and, and change their orbits. And it'll be really cool. Um, so yeah, so stay tuned. Look on, on Reddit. There'll be a lot of, I know they'll be tracking them really closely on Reddit. Um, flightclub.io, my friend Declan Murphy, um, he will have, uh, yeah, he will have a way to be able to track them because he always has this really cool thing. You can plug in these things and track the Starlink satellites. So that'll be awesome. I'll definitely be paying attention to that as well. Because I do want to see them. I would love to photograph them. I think that'd be really cool. Um, Koos, thank you so much. Michael Burke, one uh, one way to demonstrate reusability is to reuse the same booster for each Starlink launch. Gosh, can you imagine? <laughs> that would be nuts. I, I have a feeling they'll only need a small fleet. Like, they could only maybe use, I'm making up a number here, but maybe three or four boosters and just launch you know, the first 24 satellites with only a hand, small handful would be amazing. Like that would be, that would be saying something to the competition. That'd be quite threatening. Like, hey, by the way, we put up thousands of satellites with four rockets. Good luck. <laughs> uh, electron powered time traveler. Freebie, thanks everyday astronaut. That's awesome. Thank you, electron powered time traveler. Um, Nip uh, Nipponye Hito, the moon is a harsh mistress for nerd reference. There we go, yes. Um, Amar, thank you so much. Paxton Camaro, uh, I love your work. Tim, you too gave me a free super chat. Well, thank you. That's awesome. You're awesome. Uh, Sumit, the grid cluster I was referring to, referring equidistant orientation of all Starlink sats covering the entire Earth at a time would resolve astrophotography issue. Um, no, in order to be equidistant orientation, they have to be in geostationary orbit. And that's just how physics works. In order to time it with the spin of the Earth, 
The only place where that lines up is the geostationary orbit, which is like 22,000 kilometers or 22,000 miles. I don't remember. I think it's 22,000 miles above the surface of the Earth. So, I don't know, like 35,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. That's where geostationary orbit is. That's the only place where satellites will stay relative to the ground. So, and actually... Even there, don't forget, they still would cause problems. Even geostationary orbits cause problems for astrophotography because they're moving with the Earth, the stars aren't. So even though, yes, they're tiny, teeny, 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 tiny, but if you are studying and waiting for like a transit of a star and you're waiting for this to see a little tiny blip of a star, um, you do have to still take into account geostationary orbits and geostationary um, observations as well. Um, it's just easier because you can at least see that, but... It's not, it's not like a, if it's in geostationary orbit moving with the Earth, it's, it's game over, you know. So, um, and unfortunately, being in low Earth orbit, in order to cover the entire Earth, you have to do this thing where you're doing different inclinations. And you, they can't all be in the same way. You can't have this perfect grid that, that moves with the Earth. You can't even do that at geostationary orbit. It has to still, it'll, the orbit will always go through the plane of the ecliptic, meaning... You can't go above and below a certain distance. So you can't actually have a geostationary orbit up at the poles just because the orbit's still moving, you know, and if it's even if it's far enough away where it takes 24 hours to move, the Earth is not moving in that direction. So you can't ever have like this perfect equidistant thing revolving around the Earth um, with it. it. It just is physically impossible due to orbital mechanics, unfortunately. Dakota Williams, great launch this morning. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to catch your stream, but there, here's a couple of toonies and a loony for you. <laughs> Have an awesome day, dude. Thank you so much, Dakota. Um, let's see. Uh, Malo, you asked if we wanted you to stay in the death suit. What? <laughs> I asked if we wanted you to stay in the, in the death suit. I may have asked that at one point. And by the death suit, I assume you mean my horrible spacesuit. Um, I did ask about that, and uh, and actually the when I first asked about the sp me wearing the spacesuit or not, the um, there's only like five percent of people saying yes, wear the whole suit. There's about forty percent of people. People forget that that when there's like something. What was it the other day? I, I asked something like, "Oh, should I bleep out the uh, the a word?" Which obviously in in my world is like not really a swear word, but of course just because my material gets played in schools. I want to make sure I'm very overly cautious, but um, 40 or something like 35 or 40% of people said, don't bother bleeping it. And then there was a couple other denotions of like, yes, censor that with a bleep, censor it with an overdub or delete it entirely or whatever. And don't forget that it was actually the minority of people thought it was okay to include that. And I'm, and I'm not saying that's, that's the right, but people were like, but that was the winning result. It's like, actually the minority of people statistically thought I should get, that I should keep the, the curse word in there. Um, and the majority of people thought it should be removed. They just had different opinions on how it should be removed. So um, statistically, it was a similar thing with a spacesuit. I actually had a minority of people wanting, in one, in one of my last polls that I ever had of it, a minority of people wanted me in the spacesuit at all. Most people just said, wear a t-shirt. And for me, I was already leaning on wearing a t-shirt because I hated wearing that thing. Um, I liked just being myself more. The whole transition away from the everyday astronaut character and just to being a normal human being <laughs> uh, probably should have happened really early on because uh, it should it went from an art project. Don't forget, if, if you don't follow me on Instagram, you can see in the old feed, um, everyday astronaut on Instagram, it started off as an art project. This whole thing, all everything I do in my life all started because I bought a spacesuit as a joke and then started taking pictures of myself as a professional photographer, started taking pictures of myself in all these whimsical settings, making up these kind of like mini stories of this character, the everyday astronaut. Um, but in that process of shooting that material, I fell in love with like all of the details of space history and flight hardware, started playing Kerbal just nonstop basically. Um, that was in uh, late 2013, I started, uh, or in 2014, I started playing Kerbal Space Program like all the time. And that, that really got me hooked. And I kept watching, um, there's this mini series called uh, When We Left Earth that was on, I think it was on Discovery. It's narrated by uh, uh, Gary Sinise. And it was really, really, really good. And I, I just, between that stuff, I, I really fell in love with the, the actual history, the engineering, all of those aspects of spaceflight. And um, so I took the everyday astronaut character initially and put it onto YouTube where I could teach people what I was falling in love with about spaceflight and all the little things that I was learning myself. 
And then I, I kind of realized that that probably should have never happened. I should have just been myself. I, but the, I think at the time I thought, you know, I had at the time, I think like 50,000 or 60,000 uh, followers on, on Instagram. And I thought, oh, I need to take, if I start YouTube, I need to take the character every day astronaut, bring it to YouTube. And I, all those Instagram followers will come with. The conversion rate of Instagram followers coming over to YouTube was almost zero. Like literally, I'll bet you still to this day, I'll bet you, or at least for the first like year or two, I'll bet you only... 5% of people came over from Instagram to YouTube. Um, there's very few people. Uh, I'll bet you anything, almost, <laughs> I'll bet you almost anything that if you look at the people here, very few of you were around for the Instagram days back in the day. Um, so I, I was starting over from scratch anyway. I should have just started as just myself. But I, for some reason I thought to me like, oh, I already have this, this audience and I need to cater to them. And it just wasn't true. I should have just been mean, done my stuff and not worried about the horrible smelling spacesuit. <laughs> um, yeah, Yu Yang, I definitely think Kerbal Space Center, um, or Kerbal Space Program was, was actually a really big part of my growth and, and my understanding for sure and my excitement. Uh, F. Hermanson, <laughs> thank you. I'm enjoying these pairs. I don't know what the pairs are all about, but this is an exciting day, pair day. Aaron Wilton, noob to space game. Love your videos. Can you explain at T plus eight minutes and 57 seconds, it looked like a sci-fi movie scene. Let's go real quick and take a look at 857 and maybe I can help explain what that was. Um, T plus eight minutes. Oopsies. Eight, what was it? 57. Okay, so this is... Um, an image of inside the LOX tank. So this is the liquid, that's liquid oxygen you're seeing inside the tank. And because they're no longer burning, it's just floating around in, in, in zero G, sloshing around there. And now you see that needs to be settled. So before a burn, they, they either will do um, a little bit of cold gas thrusters. Um, and yeah, let's watch this again. And they'll settle that liquid oxygen into the bottom of the tank. So you're seeing inside the tank, you're also seeing these are helium tanks, uh, which backfill pressure and they make sure that this tank is pressurized to about three bar or 45 PSI ish. Um, it maintains this pressure. You can see baffles to prevent sloshing. And uh, yeah, and right now, because it's not under any acceleration or not sitting on earth where you're actually experiencing 9.8 Gs, uh, because of that, this is just floating around. And so in order to settle the propellant, they will typically fire um, a little, they'll, they'll fire some cold gas thrusters that'll push the propellant, basically catch the propellant at the bottom of the tank. That way the, the pumps, the turbo pumps don't induce and suck in bubbles of, of helium, basically. Yeah, let me get all the way back to this so we don't miss anything. Make sure we're all caught up. <laughs> Play. Because they're coming up on deployment, which I'm really excited about. Good question. Hopefully that answers that. Um, yeah, that, that's unusual. We don't actually normally see that. So even if you're new to this, even if you're not new to the space game, um, that is pretty unusual. Um, let's see here. Uh, Meth, 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 Methai. I hope you will uh, consider Switzerland in your Europe tour. I love your work. Keep it up. Sorry for not being, uh, <laughs> wait, sorry. Where was that? Sorry for not being uh, too active in the Discord. Galaxy leads. Oh, awesome. Well, hey, don't apologize about that. The, the community's there for you too. Like it's that's what's so great is even when I'm gone. You know, even when I'm uh, like I was just in Europe about two weeks ago, or when I'm having to be on the road for different things here and there, personal or otherwise, the community is still there and they're still awesome. Like I love. It's so cool. Everyone, we're all learning together. Our collective knowledge base is just growing like crazy. Um, so yeah, um, and. So the thing with Europe, uh, I'll hit the biggest cities demographically that are in my analytics probably. So I think that's going to be London, um, Amsterdam, Paris, and I'll probably do like Berlin and Munich or maybe Berlin and Vienna again. Believe it or not, Spain, unfortunately, you guys, act, there's not a lot of viewership in Spain compared to other places. Um, and Switzerland, again, like not a lot of viewership there compared to even Southern Germany. Um, so you might have to travel <laughs> if you live in Europe, you might have to come to the closest city. Um, I, I can't make it to every city. I'll, and like I said, I'll probably only do five and it'll all be analytics based. Um, but those are, those are the biggest cities that I can tell by analytics. So the other, uh, I think it's 
one of the cities in Spain was like up there ish, but it's still dwarfed by even like Munich and, and other cities in Germany. Um, yeah. Okay, William uh, Stolersek. Stolersek. Uh, I live in Central Florida. I would love to meet you if you come out to KSC. Well, William, I do come out to K KSC often. It's actually been since, let me think, it was a, it was Arabsat 6A was the last time I was, or DM, DM1, oh, no, it was Arabsat, was the last time I was actually out at Kennedy Space Center, but I'll likely be out there in December. Um, so stay tuned. I, I always do, I try to do Patreon meetups when I come out to, to launches, um, and I might do a public meetup as well. So stay tuned. Uh, Christoph. Uh, have you done a possible render of Starlink in Kerbal of the full constellation then? Oh, that'd be really hard. Hold on. Starlink. We are getting very close to the deployment of those 60 Starlink satellites. Now, after deployment, the satellites will appear to be kind of clumped together, but that's totally normal. As you can probably imagine, 60 separate, separa 60 separate separation systems <laughs> is super inefficient. It adds mass, it adds complexity, and therefore it adds cost. Instead, we deploy them all at once, allowing them to slowly disperse from one another and to do so without the use of complex mechanisms. They might even bump into one another, which if that happens is totally okay. The satellites were designed with this possibility in mind. I love that. That was a good alliteration. 60 separate separations are super intricate i think is what she said all right we lost the video just there but let's listen in and see if we have any word on the deployment starlink tension rod release confirmed and okay. as you just heard we have have confirmation that the tension rods have been released let's see if we can get some video of that that would be really awesome there we go, there we go like a deck of cards. Now, as they make their way off, next they'll start to slowly drift apart and then deploy their singular solar array pointed at the sun to begin charging their batteries. And over the course of the coming weeks, the satellites will use their onboard ion propulsion systems to raise their orbit to 550 kilometers, align into their orbiter, orbital planes and properly space themselves out to providing internet coverage on Earth. And with that, that brings us to the end of our webcast for today. So to recap, we had a successful fourth launch of a booster and a successful landing of that same booster. We reflew a fairing successfully for the first time. Both of those things are pretty cool, but also cool, you just saw we deployed 60 more Starlink satellites. This puts us one step closer to being able to offer Starlink internet service to customers across the globe, including people in rural and hard to reach places who have struggled for access to high-speed internet. Thank you to the 45th Space Wing for range safety, the FAA for licensing today's launch, as well as the FCC for licensing our first operational Starlink satellites. We'd like to thank all of our viewers for tuning in, and again, our deepest gratitude to all of our veterans, both here at SpaceX and across the country. Follow our website and social media platforms for updates on our next missions and milestones. And until next time, I hope you all have a great morning just like we did. Yay. Okay. Well, again, congratulations, SpaceX. That was an awesome mission. A lot went on there. And that, it's just crazy. This is, remember, we're going to get really sick of these missions. I guarantee it, because there's going to be a ton of Starlink missions. But uh, I'll try and live stream as many as I can. I definitely can't live stream all 24 next year. There's just no way. I, that'd be a full-time job um, on its own. And I wouldn't have time to do anything else. But, me, you know, I'll try and do as many as I can, though. Okay, so Christoph, have I done a, a render of Starlink and Kerbal, the full constellation, uh, launch a rocket to show the distance? That's a really good idea, Christoph. That'd be really, really hard. What I could maybe try and do would be, and maybe in realism overhaul, it'd be worth me trying to set up at least, say, a thousand of them or something on different orbital inclinations um, and show that, oh God, the computer would probably hate that. Um, but it'd still be really cool to see that um, in those different orbits. And I could probably just cheat them all into orbit and make that happen. Um, if someone has an idea of how to easily do that, how to kind of do a, like if I could copy and paste or upload a uh, realism overhaul file, if someone knows how to do that or would want to do that for say a thousand of them in, in similar inclinations and things like that, um, let me know. Cause I would love to, to do that and then do an animation or do a, do a flight and show how hard it is, how hard it'd be to actually 
accidentally run into a satellite and things like that. Because that is true. It's really hard for people, people to understand um, the, the distances, the, the relative velocities, um, and, and all those different things between all these objects. It's not very, um, it's not very, it's, it's really hard to grasp. It's, it's not very intuitive, I guess is the right word I'm looking for. Um, so thanks for the, the idea there, Christoph. That's awesome. Samit, uh, hey, I, c you can contact Garib's scientist to know about ISRO. Okay, I will look into it. Or if you have a contact, let me know. Um, uh, Jatin, what is the center of gravity of, of a landed booster? It's very low. It's within that frame of the landing legs because the engines are, are most of the weight of an empty vehicle like that. So even though, you know, it looks really tall and skinny, it is very tall and skinny, but those tanks are totally empty. The whole vehicle at that point weighs less than 20 tons and a good amount of that weight is those engines. And those engines are slung really low. So the actual center of gravity is likely within the, the frame of those landing legs, you know, the, by the upper triangle. Um, so really it, it's actually a very stable vehicle. Um, someone has calculated relative pretty with relative accuracy where the center of gravity is. And it's again, quite low. Um, let's see. What did SpaceX mean about one sat might not race? So one of the satellites, basically they already knew had a problem and they intentionally launched it with a satellite. That's already probably not going to work. And that way they can watch it deorbit. They can make sure it, it uh, it does entirely break up as as now intended. They previously had materials on the vehicle, which would have likely which would have likely uh, survived reentry and potentially could have bonked someone in the head. Very unlikely, but um, that was a possibility. And when you have say forty thousand of these in the sky, if every single time one deorbits, you have <laughs> debris hitting uh, landing on places, that's not a good idea. So they are now one hundred percent demisable, or they will burn up on reentry. So they, the one that was defunct or, or not operational, once they stacked them, they're just letting it fly with the rest of them. It, it would take more effort to, you know, to undo the fairings and, and unstack all the, the satellites. And instead, it's just better to keep your schedule and move forward. Uh, it's just a lot cheaper to do it that way. So, yeah, so that one likely is is not going to work and they're just OK with it. You know, it's 60 out of what would be like 40,000. So or it's one out of what would be like 40,000. So it's not worth the effort to. Like take it all apart and do that again, Daniel. When you say spin, you mean twist or flip? That's true. Yeah, spin would would kind of be you know, um, yeah, would would be this way. It does not do that. Um, it actually goes uh, laterally, so it doesn't go end over end this way. It actually is yawing basically um, when it does that deployment, which is pretty cool. So, and they don't use the full booster like that. By that time, it's just the upper stage. Uh, let's see. Okay, let me try to figure it out. Where where did we go? Um, <laughs> geez. Okay. Um, Michael, art project spacesuit and bang serendipity. Wonderful, ain't it? Life has changed a lot since I bought that horrible spacesuit. <laughs> uh, Freebie 101, uh, check out new internet TV series called For All Mankind Alternate. Yes, I am going to be watching that likely this week, uh, especially when I'm waiting around in the hospital. I'm going to be watching all of that on the Apple TV Plus or whatever it is that they're doing. Um, I will be watching that. I'm really excited to see it, actually. Orlando, thank you. Um, Ian Chase, thanks as always for what you do. You're welcome. Um, Amar, thanks for becoming a member. Uh, JVal90, as a physics and overachiever from a very young age, your lack of specialized education slash mistakes makes your content so much more useful. Nerds tend to assume that people know stuff and don't explain it. That's exactly right. Like, that's, I think people always say, like, why don't you go to school and things? I don't want to become an expert in anything. When you're truly an expert, you, you might, I'm not saying generally this is probably true. It's hard. It might be harder for you if you spent 10 years in a very narrow niche of, of science. It might be hard in your bubble to understand w where you got to that knowledge base and, and what the general public might understand. I think that's kind of the whole point of my channel and me as a science communicator is that I is that I'm learning along with you guys and I still have that innocence about me that is like I don't know you know I didn't know I didn't have a strong understanding of this stuff I wasn't even a very good student and I am learning with you guys and that's so therefore I, I remember those light bulb moments so it's like oh oh that's cool because they're relatively fresh to me like this is all happening most of it happened like in my 30s already you know so um 
And that's kind of the point is that you don't have to be a rocket scientist to at least appreciate some of these things and begin learning some of these things. If you want to be a rocket scientist, you're going to be going to do a lot of school. You, academia is unbelievably important. And if you actually want to be uh, in aerospace engineering, if you want to be uh, a rocket scientist, if you want to be an astronaut, you're going to school and you better work your butt off and you better be really good at what you do and you better be ready uh, because <laughs> you're not going to get hired at SpaceX or at NASA or blah, blah, blah for playing Kerbal Space Program. That's just the reality of it. But um, hopefully you can see you know, someone like me that understands the value of all that education and the people doing the actual work. That's why I will always say I am not a rocket scientist. I'm nowhere near that. And the whole point of my channel is to make it so the average person can appreciate what those people are actually doing, what the people that are doing, spending their lives work, uh, working on these engineering, working on the science, working on all these little things that are maybe underappreciated, maybe some little tiny valve somewhere, just to make sure it's, you know, predictably 99.99999% reliable under conditions. Like that person's work, the average person here, we're not gonna, we're not going to appreciate that. But at least if we can, you know, or we won't have the opportunity to really appreciate that, unless it gets uplifted, unless all of us have a, a good enough scientific understanding to appreciate some of those things and appreciate those those hard bits of engineering and work that that these people are doing. You know, that's that's the whole point of what I do. It's not anything to say like, I know, I, I don't know hardly anything. I am far from an expert in even remotely anything. The only thing that I'm relatively good at is re kind of having a, an overall picture of some of the things, uh, enough to be dangerous, <laughs> enough to be like, enough to be enough of the general consensus to at least have an appreciation for all these little bits. So when I see hard work of someone and I, I, I can learn from them, like, I love that. I love, I have people that I'll talk to on the phone for hours to understand some of these physics. Um, Charlie Garcia is probably one of my favorite ones. He's an MIT uh, wonderkind like this. He's brilliant. He's working on his liquid, on his own liquid fueled engines. He will help explain things to me for hours, literally for hours that I have no grasp of because I've never had formal training. I've never had, uh, so that's the important, stay in school kids. <laughs> if you want to do big things in the aerospace industry, if you want to help us get off this planet, you need to stay in school and you need to work your butt off or go back to school. Um, but for me in my path, it, it does include uh, me kind of staying where I'm at in this innocent state and learning on my own uh, for better or worse so that I can continue to to, um, to educate the average person and, and to provide context for the average person. Yeah. Other, I saw really quick, no, they were not able to attempt to actually catch the fairings today. The boats turned around um, last night or this morning due to rough seas. So the fairing catchers, um, Mystery Miss and Mischief got turned away. And it was really rough seas out there. So I don't even know if they're going to be trying to fish the fairings out this time or not. We will see. So thank you, uh, JVal90. You're awesome. Um, let's see. Edwin Bear, let's try and wrap this up so I can get back to work. Uh, Edwin Bear, have you considered making a replica spacesuit like Adam Savage? Yes, I have actually tried. Uh, I had considered trying to do different things with different th stuff like that. And it, it's harder than it looks. And, and at this point in my channel, I don't think it's really worth my time to try to do something like that. Maybe for my own personal uses and to hang up like in the background somewhere. Yes. Um, I still want to do that, and I'm still working on that, actually. There is still a, a lead that I'm working through. But um, I kind of ended up doing the Starman hoodies instead of worrying about um, trying to make a, a spacesuit for myself that I'm never going to wear. But I do want to start having some replicas myself because I'm very jealous of Adam Savage's. <laughs> um, Jean-Marc uh, says, when you're, when you're in London... When you in London for public meetup? Um, I don't know when I'll be in London for a public meetup. It'll likely be 2020 uh, if I'm able to do like a European thing again. Um, and only for that purpose. I'd come to Europe for that purpose to do meetups and hang out and, and get community together. That's the whole point of meetups is from you guys to be able to meet other people in your areas. Um, just, just so that there is that sense of community so you can you can bond with other people locally and realize that there's other people with similar interests. And in general, what I love about the space community is it's so positive and everyone's on the same team in space, even if it's, you know, if you work for Blue Origin and you work for SpaceX, like you're both doing the same thing. You're both working on getting humans um, off this planet and getting space hardware into space and, and growing our actual knowledge base based on your hard work. So everyone realizes that. And even though there's friendly rivalries or sometimes not so friendly rivalries, rivalries between companies at the same time, like we're all on the same team and, and that's really important. And so it's fun to get these communities of people together so everyone can realize that, oh, there's other people just like me with the same interests 
right next door. I think that's really important and really cool. So yeah. Night Fox. I know plane tickets to Japan are expensive. I buy one every year, but hopefully this will take a small oh chip out of it. Let me know when you'll come. Uh, I'll translate for you and I'll show you around as much as I can. Thank you so much, Night Fox. Jeez. Thank you. Everyone say thank you to Night Fox. That is insanely generous. Um, that really means a lot. And I really, really hope to make it to, again, to Europe and to India and, you know, Southeast Asia and Asia and stuff like that. So someday, fingers crossed, I am a very busy human, but this all sounds very exciting and I would love, I would love that so much. So thank you, Night Fox. Um, everyone say thank you for night tonight, Fox. Um, that's awesome. Um, Arvid, uh, you should go to the Nor Norwegian Space Center. Uh, it's, it is from uh, Norway, almost started World War III. Yes, I've heard about that. Yes, I would like to see that. And I also needed, I was going to do Sweden on this last trip, ended up not really having time to do that um, because I want to go to Stockholm and see the world's largest scale solar system. Uh, Rob Yale, anyone else think Elon is the man who sold the moon? <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe he is. Uh, thank, <laughs> thank you, Rob. Um, Paniz, do you have any plans to release another album? Yes, I'm working on finalizing 27 Merlins as we speak. Actually, I'm working with a producer uh, and an engineer this time to clean that up and make it sound much better than it does because I am a very terrible sound engineer and producer and horrible at mastering. So I'm actually getting it sent out this time. So it sounds a lot better than maximum aerodynamic pressure and a lot better than what's on YouTube. Um, and when it comes out, hopefully it'll, um, it'll be a much better product. And I hope to have that out before the holiday season, but who knows? I have so much music and I want it. That's the whole deal is I want to find a producer that I can work with that. I can just send them all of my stuff and just say, make it better instead of me spending any more time. Cause there's just way too much of it. So yes, there will, I, I'm working on basically a partnership and in which case the music will actually come out um, a lot quicker. Christopher Johnson, probably the greatest use of Starlink won't be worldwide internet, but will be an amazing bluff for planetary defense system when aliens, uh, amazing, probably buffer for a planetary defense system when aliens show up. <laughs> I hope that's, yes, that's probably true. <laughs> Thanks, Christopher. Um, Om Otto, thank you so much. Um, Z244824, please visit Kansas Cosmosphere. I think it'd be awesome to buy a, a ticket to share a tour with you, uh, get your reactions from the artifacts. Yes, I live really close to that, actually, and I keep meaning to visit it. Um, it's a little out there, though. It's like west even of like Topeka, I think. Or it's like it's it's in the middle of Kansas, but I, I do really want to visit that. I know there's some really good stuff. Um, and yeah, I think it's, I think it is the largest collection of, um, Soviet and Russian hardware outside or in the United States. So I definitely want to see that. And, um, yeah, maybe I'll do a meetup in the area. Um, Jatin or Jatin, uh, why don't they deploy the Starlink closer to orbit 300 versus 550? Um, it all depends on, so the closer you are to orbit, the less time actually, um, or the closer you are to the surface of the earth the less time you actually have in the field of view of someone on the ground or a ground tracking station. So if you're further away, you actually quickly uh, increase your amount of time seen by the observer. So the, the higher you are, the less satellites you need to provide the same amount of coverage, but the higher you are also, uh, the less, the more latency. So the longer it takes light and, and radio waves to, to go back and forth. But also, the higher the orbit, the less atmospheric drag you have. So at 300 kilometers, you actually have a significant amount of atmospheric drag. And you deorbit within, say, two or three months. I'm making up a number, but somewhere within a month, month's time scale. So maybe one to six. I have no idea. Um, at at 400, or 550 kilometers, uh, it, it tapers off pretty dramatically. So you actually would significantly increase um, your orbital uh, and decrease the amount of propulsion you need to do in order to maintain your orbit. The the bad thing about that is if you do have a satellite go defunct, it, it will stay in orbit longer than one that's at 300 kilometers. So there's this whole trade-off and they're constantly tweaking it. And the Starlink constellation is, you know, living and adaptable. They could actually tweak it as they get along. And as, you know, they get to their 30th Starlink, you know, mission times 60 satellites, whatever that is, you know, 1800 satellites or whatever, and they could actually change the orbits of the entire thing relative, uh, at least orbital altitudes. They can't really change the inclination too much. That's really expensive. But, you know, there's things they can do and, and tweak and, and hone in on that based on, you know, parameters and all that stuff. And it's a constant trade-off. Everything about rocket science and everything about rocket engineering 
is all always a trade-off. There's there's good and bad out of every single decision you make. So yeah, it's all it's all these optimizations. Bert, thank you for becoming a member. Uh, Thomas, hey Tim, I believe the KSP Starlink demo uh, could be done by generating this, this save file with a simple program. A programmer could do it. Ha ha. Well, Tomas, if you can handle that, you let me know. Um, that would be awesome. Close call. Starlink live streaming. Happy Veterans Day to all those uh, who have honorably served. Good, good. Thank you for saying that. Close call. Um, yes, in the United States again today is Veterans Day. I have a lot of friends that have served in the military. Um, one of my best friends served in the Navy as an EOD officer. I don't know if, I don't know how many of you know this, but actually, uh, one of my best friends is actually the fifth surviving quad amputee. So he actually was a Navy EOD officer, which is a explosive ordnance disposal, um, meaning he was out there, you know. Um, with like Navy SEALs and stuff. He served in Afghanistan. They were, they, uh, you know, he was looking for bombs basically in IEDs and they got ambushed one time. He, unfortunately, they kind of ran into this building that had already been cleared several times. And he was the guy that led the charge and, and was looking for IEDs still. Unfortunately, he stepped on one that went undetected and, you know, totally flew through the air and on impact realized immediately that he'd lost, um, everything except for basically like he had just pieces of one of his hand and ended up having to have that amputated once he got um, saved basically. But um, yeah, that's my friend, Taylor Morris. Uh, Taylor, if you're watching, hi. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, that was a crazy, that was 2013. That was a crazy time. Um, The military stuff is not fun. Uh, It's a sad necessity, I think, as far as our our current understanding of the universe and, and our human condition. But it, uh, yeah, it, it's it's a tough situation for those people that do serve, um, regardless of your belief system. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's an emotional thing. So to those of you veterans, uh, happy Veterans Day and thank you for your service. Um, yeah, that's always going to be a um, yeah a close a close thing to my heart. So. Zach Spencer, uh, YouTube gave me, and by the way, he's doing great now. I should, I should mention that Taylor is kicking butt. He got married in 2015, uh, to his girlfriend that was with him through everything. They're kicking absolute, butt. Gary Sinise actually, who I talked about earlier, built them a home with the tunnels to towers foundation, um, and wounded warrior program. I, I think it's actually wounded warriors, uh, are the ones that built the home. Um, but yeah, he lives here in Northeast Iowa and, uh, they are doing awesome. He's kicking butt, totally independent. Um, he went right back at it basically like right away. He, he recovered unbelievably fast and he's amazing. So yeah. Um, also we got him a ride in 2014, February, 2014. We got him a ride in Ken blocks race car, which was awesome. That was kind of one of the first times where, um, my friend and I, Ben, we kind of assembled this like media department to help Taylor share his story and, and to help him, you know, do whatever he wanted to do. He was getting all these cool offers and his, his goals were to either ride in an F1 car an F-16 or Ken Block's race car. Those were the three things he wanted to do. And we ended up getting him a ride in Ken Block's race car. And at one point, Ken Block's race car, uh, for those who don't know who Ken Block is, he does Jim Connor, those drifting videos where he goes nuts um, all around the world. Uh, even on gravel, it stopped so fast, it actually popped Taylor's legs off. His, his, uh, his prosthetics went right out of his sockets because it was braking so hard. That's how much uh, braking force, even on gravel, that car had. It was unbelievable. That was a fun day. Um, yeah, sorry. That was a long rant. Zach Spencer, you two give me a free super chat and you deserve it more than any other creator. Follow Keep with the amazing work, Tim. Your demeanor brightens my day. Thank you, Zach. That really means a lot. Uh, I, I love what I do. I, re- I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't just absolutely love it. And the community makes it so much better. I think I have the best fans in the world. Uh, my Even the uh, for those of you that don't watch Our Little Cruise Future, we talk about this often. Um, and behind the scenes, I oftentimes just, I'm like, guys, my fans are the best. And they, they agree, Joe Scott's and no offense to Joe Scott's fans or Ben Solon's fans, but they're always like, dude, your fans are awesome. Cause you guys go so far out of your way to help me do things. Um, including the discord channel. Um, yeah. So thank you again for my awesome <laughs> community. You guys are the best. You really, really are. Uh, you go above and beyond. So thank you, Zach. Uh, that's also a shout out. Don't forget. I do a weekly podcast called our ludicrous future. Uh, it's on YouTube. It's also on anything you listen to with two other YouTubers. So if you want more weekly and daily or weekly space news and more informal, just kind of conversational, a way to chew up almost two hours of, of your day once a week, our ludicrous future. There's a link in the description. Be sure and give that a listen and subscribe to that right now. Uh, Christoph, 
Uh, for all mankind, makes me makes you think of the alternate view and perception. Uh, mindsets and emotions people went through in the USA and Russia and the world. I'm really excited to watch it because I think that's really important just to have that perspective. Um, especially, you know, when you grow up in the United States, there's always a lot of, you know, I think most, um, you know, most countries and, and wherever you live, there's always like a certain amount of pride and nationalism. But I, I always think stuff like that's really important, you know, especially looking at the space race from a, an alternate viewpoint other than where you grew up. Um, can definitely be eye-opening. And so even just seeing that taken to the next extreme and a, an a alternate history version might be a really cool eye-opening thing that helps you kind of appreciate things from the other side. So um, I'm really excited to watch that. Marty, uh, at T plus 101.33 something past stage two, please comment. So stuff falls off of stuff all the time. I, I need to remind people of this. There's ice chunks. There's stuff like this is totally normal. So there's going to be ice chunks falling off of the stage. You can see little things here, likely ice. And let's see. Yep, that's likely an ice chunk. Because don't forget this, this vehicle is frozen, basically. And it's still covered in sheets of ice. And that ice melts off and, and also gets purged. The, the oxygen gets purged off. Um, and it turns into to chunks of actual solid chunks of oxygen at, at that valve. And lots of times parts of that will break off. There's just bits. That's not stuff flying by. That's stuff floating away. Um, things flying by. This is such, this is like a GoPro and imagine a GoPro trying to capture a bullet, you know, or, you know, even, even a GoPro, imagine having a GoPro and a, and a jet flies by 10 times faster than normal, um, say a, a kilometer away like you're not gonna see that <laughs> it'll just be you, know, you might see like the craziest streak ever the relative velocities of space flight is is almost impossible to understand it's really hard to grasp and uh yeah so when you see stuff like that that's just bits of of most almost always ice it's almost always ice because spacex doesn't use explosive bolts um, or pyrotechnics they use only hydraulics and pusher systems to do uh, deployments so they don't leave st space debris um, on orbit. So yeah, just keep that in mind. Uh, but yeah, hopefully that answers your question, Marty. Michael, whatever you do, don't sign away the rights to your music. I don't. And I, the reason I make music was first and foremost to be able to use it in my videos myself without it getting flagged. That was like the number one priority. But now uh, it just as my channel has grown, it's my opportunity to give back. And so I always encourage small use, small creators. If you have a YouTube channel, and you're, you're just creating content for yourself or educational content, please use my music for free. Uh, just maybe do on-screen, go ahead and just put an on-screen uh, little little uh, credit and a link in the description to everydayastronaut.com slash music and use it for free. That's that's my gift to you. It won't get flagged. It's I intentionally left it out of the cataloging system that would potentially flag any of that stuff. And because I'm the sole owner of it, um, entirely sole owner of all my music, uh, I don't even give it to any, like I have not wanted to work with any labels or anything like that or any other distribution because I don't want it to get flagged. I don't want to worry about people that I've given the rights to and said, go ahead and use that. Like, cool, you're working on a school project. Yes, use that. If that all of a sudden got blocked, it would ruin my day. And I don't want to sit there and respond to emails like, yes, I gave them permission. Yes, I gave that person permission. Like the net gain of that yeah, if you're a business and you want to license music for a commercial or a rocket launch, hit me up. Like that would probably be fair. But as far as a personal, if you're a small creator working on videos and, and you want music in the background, it'd be an honor to use my music. Like that's what it's there for. And it, like, why not? <laughs> what would I have to gain for trying to be greedy about that? Like the whole mindset of the industry is so weird and like copyrights and stuff is just crazy. I get it. It's a weird subject and it's a tricky place to be right now. But at the same time, like I'm on the, the side of airing of like, I don't want to be bugged by that stuff. Like use, use my content. I, I worked really hard to make it. I want it to be shared. Like that's what it matters. So yeah, people are asking when the launch is. The launch was about an hour ago. Mm, yeah, more than that. <laughs> an hour and a half ago. <laughs> okay. Um, and this will be the last little bit here. Nicholas Boyce, uh, only good YouTubers get good fans. Well, thank you. I have genuinely the best fans, and I don't think anyone can argue with that. 
Oh, yeah. So, um, that's guys, that's going to be it for me. Uh, one last reminder, if you want to, if you see anything in stock right now before the holiday season, get it because we're trying really hard to beef up stock in my web store, everydayastronaut.com slash shop or shop that every everydayastronaut.com. So if you see something that's in stock that you want, you better get it right now because likely all of that stuff will be gone before the holidays. Um, I will probably, I'll probably add a few leftover inventory to the rapid unscheduled discounts. Um, before, um, bef- for Black Friday, I'll probably beef that up. That'll probably be what I do for uh, a Black Friday sale. We'll be have that beefed up with a few things. But other than that, like, get in here while we can before stuff is sold out. Um, like I said, later this week, I think I'll have, um, we found a small batch of these left over, and that's going to be our last run of Grid Fanaticosters before I find something new to do. Um, also, the Aerospike engines will be, um, these shirts will be updated here, so, or like the quantities will be updated. Um, I think all of the, um, most of the olive green, the, the they're kind of the army green, they, we should probably rename it to army green instead of olive heather, but that's technically what color it is. Um, these are mostly out of stock, but I think we still have some gray ones. So if you want these, and remember all the shirts now, or most of the shirts that have these little tags, those are way cooler. Um, these tags are awesome. They're like custom hand sewn on there. Like uh, and they have new tags and everything. I'm really excited. The shirts have come a long way. They're really high quality. They're the perfect match between soft and cozy, but still like durable and fitted. They're just the right blend because they're ring spun cotton instead of the tri. I like tri blend a lot, but it can wear out really quickly. Um, so this is the right blend, in my opinion, between uh, durability, comfort, lightweight, but not too lightweight, just right in the middle so that everyone's happy. Um, but yeah, so if you see something in the store, you better get it now before it's gone. Um, we even, you know, I have launch prints. These are original um, pictures that I took myself, uh, including lots of Star Hopper ones. And I think there's a few more. Yeah, Star Hopper, it's Falcon Heavy. Um, yeah. And then also some, remember I was talking about that, you know, I used to do the art project of Everyday Astronaut. I do still have some of these in stock. I even stocked up on a couple more that I need to add in there, I think. But yeah. Oh, which ones did I add? That's going to be a nightmare for me to remember. I have to add. Did I not add those? I don't know. I have no idea. I am the most disorganized person. I need someone. I already have people running the store, but I need someone to run my brain to run the uh, my end of the store. Okay, I'm going to go work <laughs> before I have to go back up to uh, to Rochester. So, um, again. Thank you guys for hanging out with me today. I'm really glad that the, the Starlink launch went very successfully. First reuse of a fairing ever. Fourth, first time a booster has four, flown four times and still landed. Huge congrats, SpaceX. 60 new um, uh, Starlink Constellation satellites. Hopefully we we see some passes. I'm going to check and see if it happens to pass me today or tomorrow or soon because that would be really cool. I'd love to see that train um, if we have some clear skies, which who knows. So thank you guys for hanging out. You guys are amazing. Um, yeah, I, I really appreciate everyone being here and hanging out. You guys make my day so much better. So, okay, wish me luck. I'm going to have a, a probably a really emotional week as my dad undergoes open heart surgery. So everyone, hashtag Team Russ, uh, cheer, him, cheer him on and, and keep him in your thoughts and prayers. So yeah, that'd be really, that'd mean a lot to me. So all right, guys, that's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to earth for everyday people. Bye, everybody.